being recorded. I forgot to do it before. Silly me. Please tweet your reactions to proceedings at hashtag creative lives and follow us at creative underscore lives one. Let's build the momentum. I will hand over now to Helen Chatterjee to set the scene with Errol Francis. Hello everybody, it's really lovely to be here and many congratulations to Lorna for putting together a really amazing conference over the next two days and you're in for a real treat because we've got some amazing contributors uh, from across the whole spectrum of arts, creativity and health so you're going to hear some fantastic stuff uh, as you've just heard from the brilliant kids and all the brilliant people she works with. So lovely to be here and I've just got a few slides I'm going to share with you. My role is to just give you a little bit of background. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. Any problems, shout at me, Lorna. It looks good. Well, it's great to be here. So um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what we mean by creative health, which is the main theme with a focus on inequalities. And um, I want to start just by giving some sense of what we mean when, by when we use the term creative health. And it means different things to different people. For many years, many of us have used the term arts and health. The word, words and term creative health has emerged really through the work of the all party parliamentary group and the recently launched National Centre for Creative Health. And I'm sure many of you came to our launch uh, a few months back. And here we're defining creative health as creating the conditions and opportunities for arts, creativity and culture to be embedded in the health of the public. And the National Centre, as I say, was launched back in, was it February or March? Somebody remind me. Um, and that's a place, a great place to start where you can find out about the, the work that's going on at a national level, uh, uh, particularly around policy and strategy, uh, where we're thinking about how we can uh, embed the sorts of work that you're going to hear about today across the whole of the health and social care and those wider systems. So that's really important work. And that was uh, one of the key recommendations that came out of the all party parliamentary group for arts, health and wellbeing's creative health report. And that is a really brilliant place to start if you're new to arts and health and creative health. The report, which was published in 2017, led by Rebecca Gordon Nesbitt and the APPG, and many of the people who are contributing here today are featured in the report. They contributed to the workshops and gave advice. Um, to the whole inquiry. And this is such a brilliant resource that we have. There's over 1,000 different references to research projects, uh, studies, evaluations, projects, programs, and reports. So it's a really good place to go and find out more about creative health. And you're going to hear about some of those uh, projects over the next couple of days. And what that report said is three key areas that arts and creativity contributes to health. The arts can keep us well, aid our recovery and support longer lives, better lived. The arts can help meet major challenges facing health and social care, including aging, long term conditions, loneliness and mental health. And finally, the arts can help save money in the health and social care services. And you're going to see some brilliant examples of that drawing from lots of fantastic work across the UK over the next two days. Another brilliant resource, and I'm hoping that many of you are already members of the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, which is linked to the National Centre for Creative Health and the APPG. This is a resource of over 6,000 different professionals who are linked up and working together. There are regional leads and there's an amazing set of resources. So if you're not a member, please join the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance. And then also represented here today, the Lived Experience Network. And many of our contributors are active participants and indeed help launch and set up the Lived Experience Network. And that's just also a great way to access information about uh, the lived experience and how that's a key part of the work that we're doing and indeed why we're doing the work that we're doing. And linked to those two organisations in particular, the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance and the National Centre for Creative Health, we're going to hear a lot about social prescribing. Um, some of you all have been working around social prescribing for many years and, and are not new to it, but others may be new to it. And these are also two great resources you can go and visit. The new National Academy for Social Prescribing, which has a direct partnership with the National Centre for Creative Health, and the Social Prescribing Network, um, set up by Mike Dixon and um, Marie Polly. And that was launched several years ago now to bring together in a similar way to the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, all those people who were working at 
the front line around social prescribing, arts, creativity, nature and health and other areas of social prescribing. So do check out those resources if you're new to it. My own work and a lot of the work of the people who are presenting here today, including Lorna, is really at that interface of research, policy and practice. And so this diagram just shows you, I guess, how all of that links in. And really at the heart of all of that is the participant and the lived experience. And I think that will really come through today. So just to finish off, um, if you're interested in the sorts of work that we're doing here at UCL, a lot of the work that we've been doing is very focused on uh, arts, creativity and those wider community assets. I would include in that other aspects of culture, access to the outdoors, nature, green space, blue space, and particularly how those sorts of assets can be repositioned to support people who face the most severe inequalities. And that's represented in a lot of the projects that we're working with the National Centre for Creative Health and the National Academy for Social Prescribing on. So if you're interested in knowing more, do give us a shout. Um, I wanted to just uh, shout out about our March network, which I know some of you are already involved in. That's a, a big UKRI uh, research funded network that brings together lots of the people who are interested in community assets. So there's also a load of great resources if you're interested in this area that you can visit at the March network. And then finally, if I can be so bold to take one or two extra minutes, um, other exciting developments at UCL and many of our contributors here today are very kindly contributing to our new master's programme in creative health. And here we're looking to create a new generation of socially engaged scholars and practitioners to meet what we hope are really changing aspects of health and social care through things like the integrated care systems bringing in the wider voluntary third uh, and uh, community sector where personalized care, social prescribing and health equity are really mainstreamed alongside that really important participant experience. So if you're interested in postgraduate uh, teaching or contributing specifically to the master's program, then do give us a shout. And this is the first program of its kind in the world. It speaks directly to the APPG Creative Health Report, where there was a recommendation specifically around the need to have focused training and education around arts, creativity and health. So if you're interested in knowing more about it, follow us on Twitter or give us a shout if you'd either like to join us on the program or contribute to it in some way. And at that point, I'm going to finish off we're going to share our slides sorry that was a whistle stop tour but I want to make sure there's enough time for everybody and I want to hand over now to the brilliant Errol Francis. Errol is an alumnus of UCL he did his PhD at the Slade and has been a practicing artist uh, for the past uh, many years and does brilliant work through culture and and Errol's going to tell you a little bit about that work now and the fantastic work that uh, the culture and team do and it really speaks to what we mean by creative health particularly at the interface of tackling on the ground within communities uh, health inequalities so over to you Errol and thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you thank you Helen um, and um, thank you so much for inviting me to share our work. Um, I'm just going to um, share my screen um, all right, uh, there we go. Um, right, um, I hope everybody can see that. Um, so yeah, um, as uh, Helen has said, I'm artistic director of um, Culture And, and uh, um, um, we're gonna talk about, um, I'm just gonna share with you our highlights from our creative um, health projects um, from 2017 to um, 2020, basically, or actually it comes up to the present year. Um, so just to, to, to say what we do, uh, Culture Hand has been around since uh, 1988, and our aim is to pr promote uh, intersectional diversity in the arts and heritage sector. Um, and we, our main aim is to um, uh, diversify the workforce of the heritage sector and the arts sector, which we do through our flagship programme, the New Museum School, but we also deliver public programmes in collaboration with arts and heritage organizations. And we see creative health and well-being as a really important um, area to address in our programs. And I wanted to share some highlights from, from, that, from that work. Um, now, um, Culture And has a long tradition of um, uh, uh, programming music. Um, 
and addressing diversity in, in many different genres of music. And um, I, I, I really love music myself. And I do recognize the um, well-being um, potential of music in a number of different um, experiences for people. And um, this project uh, uh, is a collaboration. I've worked with the composer, contemporary composer, Jocelyn Pook. And um, we have collaborated over a number of years, actually, since uh, 2014, when I directed the Anxiety Arts Festival. And this uh, piece of music called the Anxiety Fanfare was commissioned uh, by, uh, from uh, Jocelyn uh, for the 2014 festival, but we have since then um, produced it uh, twice in uh, 2017 and 20, 2018 at King's Place, South Bank Centre and also up in Hull. And it's a really um, exciting, I think, project in terms of collaboration and the way um, we can address uh, mental health and um, the lived experience of mental health also also to uh, tackle the um, d diversity in, in uh, classical music, which is, has this reputation of being obviously quite elitist. Um, and um, the, with the, when this, this uh, piece of music was designed to be participative between mental health service users as performers and professional um, musicians in terms of uh, a, a, a chamber orchestra and um, uh, vocalists, um, you know, a, um, a soprano, mezzo-soprano, um, a, a, a countertenor and a bass baritone. And this is the, uh, the performance of it at um, uh, King's Place that we um, produced. And Jonathan Peter Kelly, he, he's the conductor, um, and he's also the, amazingly the singer as well. So it's an amazing role for a musician. But the choir, each time this has been performed, um, the choir has been made up of mental health service users. So the first time it was um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Mind and Soul Choir at the Maudsley Hospital. And in this performance, it was the People's Choir from the Centre for Mental Health at Nottingham. Uh, Nottingham University and what's really exciting about this piece of work is not only the way that the five movements of the music address different experiences of anxiety everyday experiences of anxiety in our in our lives but the way that it um, creates an opportunity for uh, non-professional singers to train up and perform alongside these professional musicians and it's an amazing process actually um, where and initially people think oh my goodness, we, we're not going to be able to do this. And it's just so exciting to see the way that people develop their performance um, skills. And Jocelyn has actually written the music in such a way that it is quite accessible and, and learnable and performable by people who are not um, uh, uh, professional musicians. So um, that, that uh, um, we'd love to do it again. It's a, it's a really interesting um, uh, process, as I've said, in, in terms of the rehearsal process and the performance. And um, the first time, actually, I, I should say I'm quite proud of that um, we actually premiered this work at the Wigmore Hall. And it, you can't want a more sort of elitist cultural space, actually, in a way, than the Wigmore Hall. And yet the, the, these mental health service users got trained up and did a fantastic performance at, at the Wigmore Hall. And as I've said, we've done it again at South Bank and um, uh, King's Plays. Um, we did another project with um, Jocelyn um, uh, um, uh, in uh, 2018, and it was part of a program called Hysteria. And his, we were taking a very um, specific meaning of the term hysteria, which is the manifestation of um, 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 psychological uh, trauma uh, in, within the body. Um, so this is a quite um, specific interpretation of hysteria and this piece of work uh, uh, the hysteria song cycle um, was a collaboration with a psychiatrist and um, patients who'd experienced these um, physical symptoms and um, uh, uh, very unusual things um, uh, people losing their voice um, their hair experiencing uh, inexplicable, inexplicable uh, physical pain as a result of some kind of psych psychological experiences. So the, the piece actually involves these um, uh, performance um, uh, um, accounts by people of these experiences that are then set to music and interspersed with comments from a psychiatrist who then actually talks about 
her own uh, physical manifestations of trauma as a result of listening to her patients. So it's, it tries to tackle this divide between patient and, uh, and doctor. And this is Melanie Pappenheim, uh, the mezzo-soprano, um, uh, um, uh, performing the work at um, uh, Hoxton Hall. Um, more recently, we've collaborated with the Welcome Collection, and, and this was a, a really a much a, a different way to tackle health issues. We use the kind of science fiction concept of cyborg, and this really came out of my research at UCL, actually, with my PhD, in how the, um, uh, the, the, this concept of the cyborg, um, a part human, part machine, part animal um, construct, how we can actually uh, raise questions about what it means to be human and what happens to this sense of humanity when uh, technological interventions are made into the body. So the Welcome Collection was an ideal space to do this. And um, we uh, had lots of uh, academics, we had a film program, we had artists um, um, uh, installations. And uh, again, there was also music involved. And this is the trans, uh, performance artist Rebecca Ubuntu doing an amazing questing performance, um, a, um, a, a, which was a highlight of the program. And um, uh, you can go on the Welcome website and see more of the material that we presented. It was all, it was all done over one evening on a Friday um, at the Welcome um, um, building. Um, uh, more recently, um, we have, been working around the theme of um, dementia. And um, this particular program, the Memory Archives, was delivered at the London Metropolitan Archives in uh, 2019. And the aim of this was to kind of tackle a two-pronged um, uh, um, way of addressing um, diversity. One of them was to gain more diverse access to the LMA collection, which is a collection of documents and mainly documents and objects, mainly used by professional researchers. And we felt that this collection had potential to people who were not um, professional researchers, but people uh, from black, many black and minority ethnic communities um, living with dementia, um, we're living with dementia and for whom the archive represents a, a repository of memory. And so what we did was to pick out um, a key documents and records uh, from the archive and we try to animate these archives in in a um, um, multi-sensory way using sound using smell using touch and which is all kinds of senses which are not normally thought of when we engage with archival material um, and um, uh, the, this uh, tape this cassette tape that you can see there was one example of an archival record um, an audio record that we then made accessible within the archive um, uh, building um, on period devices and um, 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 so that people could listen to historical material that was part of their experience. The people, um, uh, so-called Windrush generation, this was done on Windrush Day in uh, 2019, for whom these records represent their own memory. And it was, a, you know, we had people from care homes, and, uh, and day centers um, coming into the archive, people that don't normally come there. And um, it was really very, very successful. And we're, we're going to repeat this. We are working with the city of London this year to deliver it remotely. And um, this brings me to, um, um, uh, sorry. I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but we're, we're running yes. a bit low on time. We're, so okay, if, right. <laughs> fantastic projects I wonder if you could pick right. up your session which is a bit later and also if you'd be prepared yes. to share your slides with everybody definitely uh, yeah so I, that was the last that was the last bit the culture box project and well, I can talk more about that I'm sorry we run out of time there's oh, always more really sorry. to say we're very That's okay because we've got so many fabulous speakers but thank you very much to Errol as you said, they really do such brilliant work at culture and so I'm going to hand back to Lorna who can fill you in on our next session and thanks very much to Errol and all of you. Yes thank you Errol that was fascinating and I could listen forever um, but now it is time for Hela, um, Humera Iqbal to um, present uh, the next conversation.
which is Athari Prasad and Jumana Enil Aboud. Over okay. to you, Jumara. Thank you so much, Lorna, and thank you for all your amazing work across um, in organizing uh, this amazing event. You've been absolutely remarkable. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Humera Iqbal. I'm a social and cultural psychologist um, at UCL, and my own research is about uh, migration and minority groups. Um, at the moment, I'm working with the stateless community in Pakistan uh, to understand, uh, you know, kind of many challenges they face living in um, informal settlements and also to do with citizenship. Um, in my own work, of course, um, I do draw on the arts um, and cultural heritage. And so um, this is how I came to meet Helen. And I'm, I'm also very kind of interested in um, creative kind of health. Today, um, I'm really delighted because we're going to have a conversation between two uh, brilliant women, um, Arti Prasad and Jumana um, Aboud. Um, and Arti, are you there? Yes, and Jumana, you're there too. Um, okay, so let me introduce uh, um, Arti and Jumana um, right now. So you'll probably see them on the camera. Uh, Jumana, would you give a wave? Hi, and Arti. Oh, here you are, give away, thank you. So let me introduce the two of you. Um, Arthi Prasad is a writer, a broadcaster and researcher with an academic background in genetics. Um, and her writing has explored the intersection of science um, and technology with people, idea, history, health and the environment. Um, she's going to be really drawing from her work at UCL today. And um, her work, um, her research centers on ur urban help, health and public engagement with science in Kenya, where she works on solutions for sustainable waste management in informal settlements. So really looking forward to hearing uh, more about this, Arti. And Jamana, um, Jamana Abud uh, is an artist who works with drawing, installation, video and performance, exploring personal and collective memory, loss, longing and belonging. So uh, uh, Jamana joins us from Jerusalem today, and um, she in her work is inspired by the cultural landscape of her home. Um, she draws on the traditions of Palestinian folklore and myth making by collecting stories and fairy tales and retelling them. And what's interesting about her work is that these folk tales are very much connected with landscape. Um, so nature plays a big part in her work. Uh, now, these are two very different, uh, two women doing quite different work, but there is definitely um, a kind of overlap between them. And that is the link between the environment and space uh, and people's connection to the environment and space. Um, so the way this um, kind of intervention or discussion is going to work is that we have around 30 minutes to have a conversation uh, between Jamana and Arti. So they'll be talking to each other. I have some questions prepared as well to get things going, but it's very much a kind of organic uh, conversation. I don't know if it would be helpful for everyone else to turn their videos off. And so we just have uh, Jamana and Arti. I think that would be good. So if everyone wouldn't mind turning their videos off. Um, thank you. OK, so that's 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 great. Um, OK, so to get us going, um, uh, Arti and Jamana, my first question to you really is, what does creativity mean for you and what role does it play in your lives and, and in your work? And you may want to kind of introduce yourself to, uh, again when you begin. So Arti, shall we start with you? Yes, hi, thank you so much, Mara. It's a really pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to Helen and Lorna for the invitation. Um, yes, I work on a project called Kush, which is a short word for a long <laughs> uh, grant that we um, were awarded by the Welcome as well. And it's, it stands for complex, um, complex urban systems in sustainability and health. And what that means is within any urban environment, there are a multiplicity of factors that impact on each other and ultimately hits um, the way we live within that space and affects not just our physical health, but our well-being. And our project works in six cities across the world. But my personal um, grant is working on a public engagement uh, sub-project in a city called Kisumu in Kenya. And it's on the shores of Lake Victoria. And we were asking people what priorities, what the priority was for them in terms of sustainability. Uh, and we're working with very marginalized people, again, in inform, four informal settlements. And um, they came back with waste, rubbish. It, it is this huge problem 
that's very visible and has huge impacts, but many surprising things came out of it too. And I think for the question of um, how creativity tackles life, life's inequalities, there are two answers that I have. And one is a, because I work with rubbish, it's a very, very real um, role in how people are using what is perceived as waste. That is the physical act of making. Um, in contributing to people's own agency in improving their own lives and their families, but also in making their communities better. And the second thing, I think there's a very, very universal inequality and that is the issue of whose voices are heard. And people who live in these marginalized communities are often not asked questions by by the government, by the local government, the people who are making policies, who are planning the urban infrastructure um, and who are budgeting. So um, it's not just who, whose voices are heard, but who's are listened to. And so part of our project is bringing those voices to policymakers um, and through journalism and through training young people to, there was a young person we're training who said, uh, I wanna tell, able to tell people what is actually um, happening here. And I think by, by getting those messages across it, it will help to reduce inequalities in, in the urban environment, but also to lives and livelihoods. But I feel like um, I wanted to hear from Jemana because I feel there's a lot of resonances actually, um, because we, we're collecting these stories on film and we're giving opportunities back to people to tell their own stories and participate in democracy. But there's, there's been a really unexpected beauty in mapping in um, understanding people's own relationships to their landscape and in not just people's experience but in the generational memories that they have um, and what we found is very much women have been keepers of these memory but not just keepers of memory but people who affect change um, in in their neighborhoods and we wanted their voices to sort of stem the tide of the superimposition of practices that they're told to do to manage the environment and instead listen to their own ideas and solutions. Jemana, would you like to respond to that? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Arati. Thank you, Humera and Lorna. It's great to see, uh, to be with you and to, um, to discuss, uh, yeah, I think um, there are a lot of these um, synergies between um, between where I am now and and my own research. I mean, for the last for a little over a decade now, I've been looking into oral Palestinian oral histories, and more recently in my um, the practice led research I'm doing at Slade, um, trying to focus on uh, stories around water sites. So I think if I can really just um, summarize where my practice is is, um, is located at it and where it kind of um, sprang from, it's, it, it came from this um, realizing that my relationship or our relationship to the landscape and to water within the landscape, um, the childhood relationship that I had growing up in Pal Palestine um, was, is very different than the adult relationship that we have with the landscape and with our environment today. And a lot of the, the factors that have uh, kind of impacted us are you know, obvious, um, obvious political uh, factors and um, as well as you know, the communities have changed. So many of the kind of folklore and folk tales that would have been told by women, so most of the storytellers were women, um, would have been from the rural villages across Palestine. And, um, and a lot of the, um, you know, because the, 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 there were so many changes over time, but we're talking about stories that were collected and, and um, transmitted for over, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. And, um, and it, um, uh, these stories, I grew up with these stories, but then uh, returning to Palestine of my childhood after having spent quite an extensive period in Canada, I realized that the that this relationship with our um, with the landscape has has changed so much. So I I'm, I'm sorry this is now becoming a much longer uh, a summary than I anticipated. But 
Um, I'm interested in collecting the tales that were once told because this practice of storytelling are not being told anymore. And I try to work collectively um, with communities and um, uh, not just with art, art communities, but also with the uh, communities in the rural villages and try to find the water sources, at least the ones that are still accessible to Palestinians and, um, and try to retell stories around those waters. So I'm trying to uh, kind of relive or, or reignite um, those practices, those folkloric practices once again, um, and, and also to connect them with contemporary stories. So um, not, you know, to kind of situate the stories um, to bridge between the past and the current uh, tales that are being told and experienced. Well, I, I just wondered, Jumana, about the water. Um, is that something that you, you talked about the water in your childhood. Uh, water is something that we also have a huge problem with in, in informal settlements and that people notice a lot. It, like people said to us, they told us what their issues were. I wonder if water was something when you started speaking to them that they resonated a lot with as well. Yeah, I think that there is you know, there's a because of um, because there's so much displacement across the country, and so many Palestinians are not able to access the water source or even you know their land. Um, that relationship to to the water becomes uh, very fragile, even more fragile. Um, and uh, but one of the things I think that you're still able that that I find that we're still able to access is through our imagination, and and that really is. Um, a possibility where, you know, through creativity and through reigniting people's imagination, through kind of telling the stories again, even if you're not physically at that water site, um, still still means a lot to people when, you know, when you invite them to, um, to remember, uh, because a lot of these stories are, were, were not, initially were not told, this is all part of an oral tradition. Um, so it, it's been very, it's, it's been challenging, to be honest, to try and, um, you know, create this community where, um, you know, invite people to remember these stories. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a mission that, I, that I'm uh, taking it upon myself. And I, I, I imagine that you also have challenges um, within the community that you're working with as well. Yeah, and that's the... That's one of the things I wanted to ask you. People were willing and open to speaking because these are the sort of knowledge that they hold. And on one side, people want to talk about it. On the other side, there's a kind of fatigue or a feeling of what's the point? You know, why should I? Because will anyone actually listen to it? And I think that's the beauty of recording the stories in the way that you're you're doing and that we're trying to. Um, if I may, I was kind of also thinking about, you know, I mean, both of you work, well, so oral histories, Jamana, you work with and intervention, I'm sorry, interviews, I imagine you do, Arti, and I mean, thinking about the link to health, not just um, physical health, but mental health as well. Uh, Jamana, do you find when you interview, um, kind of, or you talk about these, these the past, is it a, a kind of catharsis, is it a cathartic moment? Does it, do, do the, the people you talk to reflect on how, how, you know, it's painful or they felt better? Because I know that collective memory and trauma is something that you work on in, in your work. Yes, I think that it's not just talking about the past. I think actually talking about the past sometimes is, is, a, is a beautiful, uh, 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 you know, opportunity. I think, I'll, our daily lives are filled with trauma so that if you're reflecting on the past, I think it creates uh, a feeling of um, empowerment in a way. And, um, and you know, there, there's, I think with, within the work, there's a lot of, I've realized that there's generational gaps. So a lot of times it's the elderly women who were uh, telling these stories and um, collecting and, and uh, passing them on. And, Today, when I approach these women, you know, most of them would be much older um, than, or, or sorry, they would have passed on. Um, and so I'm trying to kind of find whether it's from my own childhood memories. So, you know, try to find those. And, and more recently, lots of these stories have been published. Although I, I prefer not to look at the publications, but yes, I mean, I, the interviews, 
I try to find elderly women who still remember these stories and then to try to create opportunities through workshops. So it's not just interviews, but I try to do workshops where I'm um, involving both younger and elder generation of uh, Palestinian communities so that they can also speak together about these stories within the landscape. Um, and Artie, you talked about how women have had a driving role in um, waste management or kind of talking. I mean, I wonder if you'd like to reflect on it. And I know that you have a kind of a video that you've, um, I, I don't know if you'd like to share that with everyone or is there? Yeah, um, the more we have uh, researchers working in the field because of COVID, we couldn't be there ourselves, um, but they are experts in community engagement and um, I think what became apparent and what they were surprised about, because they're from that city as well, is um, how much uh, people, obviously, I mean, people know their environment, they know where the water sources are, they know where waste is put and they know where they can take them and do something useful with them. Um, and, but, but people were also talking about things that their grandmothers did, you know, with, mm -hmm. with food waste. Um, and so those, that, oral history was there for them uh, as well. And, um, you know, when, when our project is, it's called Sustainability and Health, but when we started the project over the last months, I feel that we really focused on the environment a lot. And maybe that's because the initial stages and mapping and collecting, which is really important to know what you have. Um, and they've also started sharing their stories between different settlements um, because there's some very localized projects. Um, but, um, but there, there, there were some, the, the, what I think what we lost is we're not directly, we haven't directly asked them about their health, but I think you can see, and if you show the film clip, you'll see this is a woman who's 65 years old and she's lived in the, in this, in the formal settlement all her life. And she, um, she started doing things with waste and making, 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 um, using things that she found to make things that she found to make new objects. Um, and although they don't explicitly talk about, none of the women we interview talk about uh, mental health or well-being in these films, you can kind of see that they've, they've not just taken control, but started working with other women in their community and created something that's given them both an income with which they can feed their families. Um, but also they've realized kind of their own potential. So yeah, it'd be lovely if you, if you have time. Um, we have, I think we can share share this clip. So this is a kind of clip uh, Artie was just talking about from her her um, her work. And let's see if this works. I'm going to share the screen. And um, bear with me, please. Can you? Oh, can you see the? What can you see? Can you see the, the video? Yes, it's here. Okay, great, wonderful. I'm going to play this. Yeah. 
kuwa mchonga yeye watu wanatengeneza baada ya utungi ama kile story ukaanza kujaraga na na ukauza wakati nilikuwa na wapisa lakini nilipata kambi na mwaka kama kule hata kuliko kule kwa hiyo nikaanza kujulia hapo hata wesi ya makaa ni pesa upande wa pesa wote ya makaa ya business watu na yuza kingi mbao kama nini mbao kwa nini na kama taga sio kuchana kinyote kwa taka taka na hiyo na kama pesa kama watu sasa na teknik ni yuza hiyo pikapu Utility hapa sasa ni tenesa tili za kitanga na ifanye mpaka nikaoa kufanya kazi ya taka nikiwa taka ni pesa And I am it, it, very early on when we started the project. Let me stop um, this. Hold on. <laughs> Apologies. Continue. Sorry, IT gone. Just very early on when we started the project, when we had first meetings, we kept seeing, you know, the government kept calling. We work closely with the county government. They kept calling waste pickers who are just people from the informal settlements who have taken to cleaning their own environment because they're fed up of it. And they train younger people. And there were some very elderly women Um, and we asked them, we, the stories they were telling were wonderful, and we asked them if anyone had recorded it, and they said no. So we thought, you know, they keep saying the same things over and over to the government, and no one does anything. And here, in the meantime, they've got these things that they're doing um, and that they're making. Um, and I don't know if you noticed, on the clothes that they're wearing, there's some words on the fabric. And there's this tradition that um, fabrics are passed down from grandmother to, to granddaughter, and the, fab the words on it is a message. And it's, it's something, you know, about life and um, um, something philosophical or inspirational. So, um, yeah, that, that's why it, that's, this is a ser series that we're making, trying to collect these stories and making sure that we have captured them and then we'll take them back to, to the settlements and, and work with the women and work with the films that we've made also. It's really remarkable. It's taking recycling to a whole new level, but also, you know, I guess it's about agency, isn't it? Taking back a bit of control and being able to to kind of um, do something about difficult circumstances in a sense. So. There's no employment. There's no, um, the women, some of them are making, there's another film where they're making their own biogas because they couldn't, she's, they say things like, um, I'm so well off now. When my kids come home from school, I can give them something to eat. I mean, that, that's like something you might just take for granted, but it's made such a difference to them to, to be able to do these things and to share their stories and to capture these stories, I think. So it's more powerful than we might even realize. Hmm. Jumana, would you like to respond? Um, I, we have um, another, like, I would say five minutes and then um, please everyone, if you have questions, just um, put them in the in the discuss, uh, the kind of chat box and we'll come to them. But Jumana, do you have a response to that or is there anything kind of you would like to share about your own work that you think resonates with that? Uh, yes, thank you. I mean, up till now, um, at least for the, since the last, since this last year with COVID, I've only, I haven't been able to work as much um, collectively um, to work with groups, but I'm, I can share maybe something which has been part of an ongoing process where part of my practice um, is um, I try to find the, uh, the sites in the landscape um, where you know, stories were told, the water sites, and how they have changed, try to document through film and text and drawings how they have changed today and what kind of you know, checkpoints or illegal settlements are around them and demarcation walls and how does that you know, affect access. Um, so I can maybe share a two minute, um, shall I share my screen and then I can absolutely. share? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Or I can share it, whatever. Yeah, I'll try to share it and just up. And, um, okay. Um, so this is part of a, um, an ongoing work, as I said, which is um, uh, in collaboration with a photographer, filmmaker. Um, so we've been trying to find these sites and then I usually uh, write about them um, and try to insert some of the stories within these kind of more performance works. So this is a two minute excerpt from a a nine minute uh, video, um, which was part of a performance piece as well. 
Jemana, before you begin, is this landscape, did you capture the landscape as well? I mean, is this the landscape you've captured from, from home? Yes. Yeah, it's absolutely yeah. beautiful. Yeah. The video captures, so in the video, I tried not to show any of the demarcation wall or the kind of the political signs of the landscape. I really wanted to show the landscape as I remember it and as I feel attached to it today. And as it's my wish that, that people um, see the landscape through this way as well, because the political lens has um, distorted our vision of the landscape um, what, with obvious reasons, but I'm also, um, you know, I, I want to kind of gift this as, an, uh, as, a, as a chance for people to revisit the way they look at the landscape and, and to realize that um, although it's very difficult for us to access the water source, um, we can uh, still feel empowered or a sense of empowerment um, by, you know, remembering and by um, keeping in our thoughts and in our mind the way the landscape uh, was to us. So before I start, I will just read a little bit. How many times have I told you this tale? Do you remember? We've been here before. Shama. Shama was with us, dancing to dogs, barking their bullets, point blank pointing. Ring around the moon, ring around the moon. White sheep, black sheep, black sheep, white. Ayan Abu Zaid, Ayan Abu Fakiha, Ayan Silwan, Hamam Shifa, the Silwan Spring or the Healer Bath. Ayan Subah, Bir Sahar, for fear, for fear, for depression, skin diseases, retention, and remorse. The waters that were on, in these sites were believed to cure fear, anxiety. You are the spring of thieves. It was difficult for us to find you. Today your waters are dry. You are the spring near Deir de Buen. You are haunted by sheep, cock, ram, white cock, mouse, serpent, ox, and monkey. The spirits can take many forms, and you came to me in the worst form of all. This limb dances in the breeze, this one drives away the pain. Despite every curse you throw at my face, I still remain. I hear nothing under the branches of your trees. The songs today are kept in silence as they have silenced my song of water. So the various uh, video footage is, is collected from over 20 sites that I've been able to um, locate up till today. And this is part of a research that has been uh, started from 2009. Um, it's not always difficult. It's not always easy to find those uh, water sources, um, but that's, that's what I try to do is I try to collect, um, or when I can, I try to you know, film these sites, try to find them, try to collect the stories and then create video, poem, or storytelling performances around them. Thank you so much, Jamal. That was uh, so moving. And I really, I can understand how you captured the sense of loss as well in that. It was just beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Arti, should I give you a chance to respond to that? And then 
you know, we, I have questions for it, so it's opening up to questions, and I can read some of the questions out, uh, but Arti, I'll give you a chance to respond, and then we have about seven minutes to questions. I just thought it was so beautiful, Dora, um, and I wondered if, um, in finding those water sources, is that something you, did, did that mapping happen with, with the people you're speaking to, with the women you're speaking to? The sites that I shared now um, were not, um, it didn't happen with the woman that I've been speaking to, but other, there has, there are now uh, other sites that are, um, yeah, part of, a, a result of the woman I've been speaking to. Uh, more recently, and, and also as part of the, my PhD research at Slade, I've been focusing on, or I want to focus on three main sites um, across the Palestinian territories and uh, inside Palestine. So, uh, and these, these three sites are, are quite different in terms of their natural environment, in terms of who can access the water and, uh, and in terms of the stories around them. Um, yeah. Well, looking at the, um, the water running in the fields, it just reminded me that the women that we work with or the, the places that we work, they're not really slums in the, in the um, way that people do own the land. They're not just squatting there. But the, since you know, many, many decades ago, the government just hasn't introduced any infrastructure and population has increased. And they've probably, where they used to live, probably started like what you've just shown. I mean, beautiful, clear water and rural kind of settlement. And these women over generations have watched as, as the place has become more um, and clogged with all manner of things that have made their health worse both physically and mentally and um, it really does make me feel that when they said to us waste is a problem or our environment is getting dirty this is probably what they were carrying with them pictures like that mm -hmm. it's very powerful i just wanted to i see there's a question in the yeah there is a question um should we uh, eva would you like to ask your question you can or i mean happy or I can read it out loud. Um, Eva, you can turn your camera on. So um, Eva Sansevier, I hope I pronounced that right, asks, um, Arti's work speaks to the transformative power of creative agency in these communities. To what extent is this intrinsic to the reflection that drives the project? It's, um, it's entirely critical because um, this is the thing about inequalities and not having a voice. Um, the government started making policy to um, for sustainable waste management and they were drafting the policy but they hadn't actually spoken yet to anyone who lived in informal settlements so i asked them how how are you drafting this without having mapped and then mapping by what i mean by mapping is what Germano is doing as well it's actually it's the mental maps that women have of what they do and what people have young people too what they do where they go where things are kept the sources that they go to for various things within the environment and drawing those maps. Um, so but our project sits between the county government and the people's voices. So it's actually forming a direct line. So all of these stories are going straight to, to the government with maps, with um, a program of suggestions from the people about, and, and, and them sitting on the budgeting um, panels as well. I think but the, um, the main point is that when the government tries to do things like move a waste dump to somewhere where people can no longer access it or take the waste away themselves and recycle it, they don't know that people are using it. They don't know that their livelihoods involved and um, people are, it, it, it's um, adding to people's life and well-being and income sources. So that's why they're really critical to collecting and sharing. Um, thank you, Arti. I, Thomas, Thomas, thank you so much for pointing out that there's a question answer box as well. So we probably just have time for maybe one more question, but um, Jamana and Arti, you'll see, you can respond directly to those perhaps in the chat. So Met, Metka Poto Snick, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I'm sorry if I haven't. Metka asks, what have you found an effective way of sharing the collected um, stories or histories within the community and outside the community. So how have you shared it within the community and outside? And also thank you for an excellent conversation. And there's been a lot of um, discussion about how wonderful you both are and, and I can concur. So uh, I'll leave you with this um, kind of final question. What's the best way of sharing 
Um, Jumana, do you want to start? Yeah, I think it, it, the best way of sharing is to is is first to remember that these stories were told and that the stories help to um, they help to actually preserve those water sites because there was something that was a little bit superstitious because we believe that they were the water sites were inhabited by spirits guardians good and bad spirits so through this uh, belief and through these superstitions um, they in you know, our belief in that helped to um, uh, preserve those water sites at the same time. So what you were saying, Arthi, before about, I mean, not all the water that I've come across has been clean. <laughs> and I, and I, and uh, yeah, and I think that th this was just a two minute segment of some of the things that I've collected. Um, but yeah, through, I think we need to share those stories by just continuing all the time, never stopping to share them, to tell them. Um, even if, you know, our beliefs, even if we're not superstitious, but just, telling them and sharing them as stories is, is still quite relevant. Yeah, um, we are going to take, I, I, I'm a writer as well, and I find I, I like to collect voices that are otherwise unheard um, to, to bring new voices from different parts of the world. And, but a lot of the time, I don't know, the people you meet and talk to and journalists do this, you speak to people and, and they wonder what you did with their story. Where is it? And so we've, we've created this website that's uh, in, in all the languages that we're working in, but we're also we made it uh, a low bandwidth, but we're training young people from the informal settlement to um, tell their own stories. So we're going to take these videos and stories back to the community and the government and use it as a forum for discussion within the informal settlement to get direct responses. And I think for us, the real, um, the real uh, outcome is accountability. Um, to, to say that your voices have been collected and this time you have been heard. Thank you, both of you. Um, perhaps you might like to share, um, you know, links to your work in the in the kind of chat box. And um, Lorna, there's a brilliant question by Marwa, um, which I think could be for the whole conference towards the end. So it's about how can everyone help, but we'll leave that for then. Um, well, I, everyone, I just, um, will you please join me in saying thank you so much to Jamana and Arti, just two really inspiring, strong women. And it was such a pleasure to speak to you both. Thank you so much. Um, yes. <laughs> and bang on 12 o'clock. I will now pass over to Lorna. But again, thank you, Arthi and Jamana. It was such a pleasure. Yes, that was exquisite. Uh, absolutely exquisite. Thank you, everyone, um, for that very powerful presentation. Now it is time to hear from Jilly Angle. Is it Angle or Angel? It's Angel, Angel with a double. Angel. I don't know. Angel. Angel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wonderful. We have an angel in the in the space, uh, in conversation with Rajita Detail. So welcome to you, and back to Helen Chatterjee to chair. Well, Thank you. Thank you so much to Jumana and Arati. What really inspiring work that you're doing. Thank you so much for sharing. And straight on with our next conversation, we've got two more brilliant pa panelists, and I'm really pleased to welcome our two next panelists because I've worked very closely with both of them over the last few years through our Royal Society for Public Health Special Interest Group in Arts and Health. Um, and uh, I'll just introduce them briefly and then we'll move on to a conversation. So it's a great pleasure to introduce the wonderful Jilly Angel. And Jilly brought her experiences of being diagnosed with cancer and the role of arts to support her cancer recovery to establish the UK's first lived experience network. And I mentioned the Lens earlier and they do such brilliant work that you're gonna hear more about today. And this in tandem with her work as a yoga practitioner, therapist and community activist, have enabled her to make significant contributions across a range of committees and bodies. She's an advisory member to the National Centre for Creative Health that I mentioned earlier. She's been really critical in providing fantastic evidence, information and support to the APPG on creative health and well-being. She serves on the London Cancer Hematology Board, University College London Hospital for Cancer Clinical Trial Steering Committee, the National Patient and Public Involvement in Healthcare Sciences in Higher Education Working Group, and as I mentioned, the RSPHC in Arts and Health, which she's served on as the lens rep for many years and, and really provides such fantastic insights to us. So thank you to Jilly for joining us. And our second panelist joining Jilly is Dr. Ranjita Dittal, 
Uh, Ranjita is a, was a lecturer in pharmacy practice at the University of Reading, but I'm really, really delighted to say that she's joining us here at UCL in a couple of weeks as our new lecturer in interdisciplinary health sciences. She'll be teaching on the BASC in arts and sciences and our masters in creative health. And Ranjita's research involves investigating how the arts can be applied to reduce alcohol harm in low and high resource settings, health architecture, and co-designing engaging health spaces. And Ranjita is a, our deputy chair of the Royal Society for Public Health SIG in Arts and Health and does such a brilliant work bringing together new insights across new areas like pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences and practice um, to bear on arts and health and creative health. So thank you both for joining us. And I wonder if we could start, and Jilly, maybe you could just talk a little bit about what, what prompted you to set up the lens and a little bit more about the work of the lens. And then uh, hopefully that will lead to some fantastic conversations between you and Ranjita. And just a reminder to everybody, please post your questions in the Q&A and I will very happily post those on to Jilly and Ranjita as the conversation progresses. So over to you first, Jilly. Oh, thank you very much, um, Helen. The reason in how I set it up was purely because um, I'd had cancer. It sounds a very weird thing to say, and like anything, it's a journey. So slowly, as I went into recovery, I kind of got vaguely involved uh, with arts at UCLH because we were building a brand new cancer center, and that was just spectacular about really embedding arts into the whole of the environment. And then somehow I got asked to do a talk at Welcome, and then somebody heard me, and eventually I end up um, doing a round table um, presentation at one of the house floors for the APPG. And it was from that um, that Alex one day said, what about this idea of setting up something from lived experience? So we have the APPG and we have TRA. And for me, Lens was the other side of it. You know, it was kind of as if we were little this wonderful triumvirate. So from that, um, that's really how it started. And I, I am just absolutely passionate about lived experience, about embedding it completely in both policy and in any form of research. Um, and I, over the years, and I've, I've worked in this, this field for, very, for a very long, long time, I think slowly over the years that there has been a change, there has been a sea change. But I feel now that with the, um, where we are now in the 21st century is the fact that lived experience is at the heart of every decision to do with arts and health and well-being and you have to start from us you have to start from our experiences and i think with that this is quite complex of actually how people engage with us do you with me and i know a bit later on ranjit and i've done some kind of pre-talks about this we really want to look at actually the research and the collection of data so that's really how it started and then slowly we set up so we now have a national steering group at the lens um, we have all these wonderful people who are kind of going down into all of their own communities and gathering lots and lots of evidence base and actually creating lots of different things to do with art, which I have to say is not just painting and, and you know, kind of and, and drawing. It's absolutely everything. It encompasses everything. Um, you know, we've even done things with archaeology. We've done things with gardening. So my view is always is that it's not about you wanting to be creative. We are born as creative individuals. And what art, and I think the lived experience does, is actually allows us, it allows us to externalize something at times, which has been very complex, which maybe language you know, cannot use. I mean, from my own experience, I was in the hospital for 11 months and I wrote 32,000 words, which is very, very unusual, but as I came out of very complex kind of in critical care I couldn't read I couldn't write I couldn't do anything so initially it was that sense of putting a pencil onto a paper in order to externalize what had actually happened to me um, and I think that's how all our journey starts so you might be using dance you might be using sculpture at the end of the day in some respects which I think I'm sure a lot of researchers and funders will disagree with me it doesn't actually matter what you do as an individual it's the journey that you take. And I fully appreciate now that, which is brilliant, we've now got social prescribing of arts, which has been rolled out throughout the country. So in that respect, we get slightly more, um, we need slightly more evidence base. But I think from the very beginning, I think as individuals, our ancestors, the very first thing they did was put a mark onto a cave. And that was a bison, or that was a sense of who they were. So to me, art is just and creative health is just part of who I am 
and lens is great and long may it go and always as I say we would love you know more and more people to join um, so contact us and we'll put you in touch with lots of local people. That's brilliant. Thank you, Gillian. And Ranjit, I wonder if you want to respond to that. I mean, this, I totally agree with Gillian about the process and the journey and, mm. and, and that sort of role of arts, creativity and, and, and wider engagement in that patient journey, I guess. And that, and that speaks a lot to the sorts of research you do, I know. No, thank, thank you very much, Helen. I hope you can hear me because my, my mic, no, brilliant, thank you. And Gillian, it's been really wonderful, yes, because we've been having pre- um, conversation conversations about this and the 20 minutes um, is up is our time so we, we kind of went way over it in our talks so yeah the process and and also sort of you know the idea where do these ideas come from the potential because in, in my area um, looking at alcohol problems I used to be an addiction specialist pharmacist and um, that was and before I was a community pharmacist so, so when I first graduated and I, I was practicing I just noticed how little support there was for something that was so obvious, uh, people with drug and alcohol problems. But I was a pharmacist, I'd never been trained or sort of a space had been created to explore alcohol problems, but I was seeing patients and it was there. And I thought, well, actually I'm, I'm seeing patients, but I don't have the training or uh, the knowledge to support patients, which I could because the potential is there. So, I, and um, it was through sort of, create and, and I'm also an artist a sculptor so I was very very surprised when something obvious should be there and isn't so I see the arts as something that is, is already there we already have the answers but um, the way we develop our research or, or the research community just haven't sort of expanded enough there isn't a, enough of that range to really sort of come up with really interesting solutions so when, in my work I am um, as, as when was what Judy was saying you know, when you are, when you find out about your health, you're diagnosed, what support is there? In my work, I wanted to see how pharmacists could support this patient group, along with other health professionals, because we, we see patients as pharmacists more often than any other health professional. And we see them for a whole range of health and social problems as well. So pharmacists are seen as uh, being sort of a community um, uh, sort of sort of like community connections maybe you don't meet anybody else but you'll see your pharmacist so we, we have that huge potential in the community so really uh, sort of so my frustration as was Jilly is that we just don't um, do enough with what the potential we have and even sort of RT's uh, talk the, the waste the rubbish is all around us is there is visible is, is we see it but we're not doing very much so um, so thank you and uh, I, I don't know, Julie, we, we kind of talked about hidden lives, didn't we? We said that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we are sort of, sort of because of my, my other background is I'm also neurodivergent academic, I'm, I'm neurodiverse, so I'm severely dyslexic, I have ADHD and dyspraxia, and I discovered this during my PhD, so I was practicing as a pharmacist before, and, and when I think about where do ideas come from, I do think neurodivergent thinking, creative thinking in a space that sort of creating a safe space to do so uh, allows that. So we talked about sort of sort of hiding things sort of intentionally because the safe space isn't there and, and how do you articulate and communicate and also uh, sort of sort of sort of being invisible as well. So those are the two things that, that we were we were exploring. Yeah, totally. And I think um we were also talking about kind of the role of public health. And in, in one respect, I think prior to pandemic, I was aware of it, which I think in some respects is great, but at the same time, I wasn't really that engaged with it. Um, and I think since the pandemic, it's almost become less engaged. And I, I, the reason I say that is that we have 2.4 million people who were in the shielded category during the pandemic. And they really haven't engaged with our phenomenal skill set and our massive experience to actually know what it's like to be housebound for a very, very long time. And this got me again with Ranjita because we were both, we both love talking, we're both passionate about this subject. And it really got me thinking about how I think in some respects, going back again, thousands of years, that are the lived experience created in some respects public health that you know how 
you you know did um you you created your you know within your cave initially and and you looked out at what was happening around you slowly that kind of morphed into public health that you know if you cared for your community then the three of them it was like a bit like a triumvirate you know you would be safe as a community you would be healthy and i think for some reason i think it's nothing against public health over the years they've slowly drifted away not saying that they're not at times doing a brilliant job so as I was musing about this um, over the last few days, I was thinking it's basically a bit like the Three Musketeers, but what we need now is a reunion. We need to ask back in public health into lived experience, into art. And then we get the mantra, which is one for all and all for one. And I think by doing that, what you get <laughs> is the reality that our invisibility at times, which are for very complex reasons, is actually seen. And I think Ranjita and I were then talking about language that I have to say in all the years I've been totally embedded in a very complex health system. I've learned their languages, I've understand their systems. So I think part of our conversations about asking, inviting, not just public health, but researchers, so that we can create a bridge from almost their side to our side to come into our world, to really begin to understand our language, our nuances, which at times, is not a written language and actually how the arts in all its iterations has really helped and supported people within our community, if that makes sense. And I think by doing that, it's going to be a win-win. And I really appreciate that as researchers, I think also we're asking for a different paradigm of actually how you gather data for research into arts and health. And I think this is really pertinent at this point when you've got social prescribing being rolled out throughout the whole of the country. So I've come up with an offer, <laughs> which is the following, which is maybe for next year to have an international symposium called Hidden Lives, Hidden Gems, which would invite everybody, we have a whole list of people, to actually begin to really deep down to really deep delve down into exactly how we collect research which is validated so that the very large august brilliant research organizations in this country as well as funders will actually accept the fact that at times i work in a language which is not spoken but that is equally as valid as somebody who does so that's our offer and i know Ranjita, you've, you've created a wonderful Padlet, which I know you'll explain. So what I will do initially is put up a very kind of small A4 piece about suggestions of what we would like to do. And anybody out in the audience who would like to get involved, who would like to host, who would like to fund, you know, with lived experience, with research experience, whatever, please do. Because I think that's where we need to go. If you want us at the heart of co-creation of everything you do within research, you have to begin, or we have to begin, to look at different ways of collating that evidence, which Ranjita and I know is really valid. No, thank you very much, Julie. I've just uh, posted the Padlet there, and it sort of it has a question about is it Public Health England. You know, what, what is it that Public Health England um, are doing? How could it? Um, how could they do things better to really kind of serve? all the diverse communities that there, there are many many communities and then and then Julie and I thought it'd be nice to actually present our padlet send it to public health England some somewhere somewhere in public health England and um, we want to keep we'll keep this open for about a week or so so after this event so thoughts you know throughout this event um, from today and tomorrow anything that strikes you so you can even sort of it doesn't have to be um, all right somebody it's like Karen says she can't open the link I hope um, I hope others can open the link, um, but I will just check, but um, you can put images, you can put uh, drawings, you know, different things, words, it doesn't have to be sort of text, so that's what we wanted to do, and, you know, Julie, it's the one we were having the conversation about, uh, about research, the way it's conducted, who conducts research, and why is it? Why is it a certain type of sort of group or teams? I've worked in alcohol research for, for many years, and so arts um, isn't sort of spoken so openly and, and it's um, so strange because when I go to recovery groups and the groups that, that patients themselves have formed 
Um, it, it's almost separate to what the treatment happens in the clinics to what they find is helpful to relapse prevention. They bring in the artists to say we want to have art workshops because it helps me to not think about drinking. I, I've now developed a new hobby, I've developed a new skill, and they're so divorced and separate and it's sort of an obvious thing that they shouldn't be. And this is what I saw when I, when I was practicing um, as a pharmacist and doing my research. So it's like our research teams need to evolve and change and, and look at health and people in new ways. And the responsibility of sharing a lived experience is enormous for the person who's sharing and the person, you know, what, how to articulate, will it be a safe space? What are the consequences of sharing? Who will know? The power dynamics involved in that is very, very complex and we just haven't explored it. So that sort of tick box thing is, is really, you know, so Julie's, um, conference is going to sort of blow that apart I think so <laughs> and I think it needs it needs it really sort of and the social prescribing the evidence for all the different types of methodologies different types of people involving in research I think is so important so um, but we've had a great time Julie and I trying to do this conversation we could talk for a long time <laughs> <laughs> really fantastic discussion so far and we've got some um uh some varied questions and I've got one sort of picks up a point that but um uh, Julie started up, touched on really about and how her role has transitioned into then being an advisor within, for example, hospital committees and how that can take you beyond public health. Um, but a question from Anne, the wonderful Anne Lansley. Uh, Ranjita, you beautifully described the, the future potential of pharmacists to work in different ways with patients. What do you think the current perception of patients is in this regard? Current perceptions by pharmacists and their team. Is, is that, is that what, what the question was? It was actually, um, hi, um, Hello. Pastor, hi. Um, it was actually um, patient's perception, the public's perception of, of pharmacists. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, yes, very good question. Um, I'm also doing another study on, on health, the architecture of pharmacies, uh, about how um, patients and staff actually view each other and how patients view pharmacists. And the work that I've done in alcohol and also other sort of other work that others have done, um, patients sort of find pharmacists to be um, as like a safe space. It's a space that they can be more open about their health is, is what we're, we're, we're getting. Um, they kind of see the space as being sort of more informal. In the GP uh, practice, they think that um, they have to be careful what they say is recorded. It may sort of it, something negative may there may be a consequence of that so it's a more of a formal health environment so pharmacy is sort of linked between you know high street there's the, the, the community there's the shop next door the post office and there's the health so health is actually taking place without people realizing the you know, health activity mm -hmm. and uh, that's what's so special about pharmacy so so but at the same time there's also the the community pharmacy space um, now the government um, has introduce a, a rule well a, not a rule but a requirement that uh, you should have a, a, a consultation room in order to do some of the NHS services pharmacists get uh, paid by the NHS to deliver these services but the spaces really haven't been sort of considered carefully at all and that's my health architecture research spaces are small if you were going with a carer if you needed wheelchair access these are not appropriate spaces so you cannot talk about your health in an open way so maybe things become hidden this is that Jilly and I think about it is hidden it, it can an invisible um, you know it's actually hidden on purpose and, and therefore things aren't expressed so so there's a real real concern that the potential what pharmacists could be doing on the high street could be far more than what is going on now but on the whole uh, patients and the public can ha have a sort of high sort of uh, feel trust in the pharmacist and, and their team and I think the space could be improved a lot more and the training of pharmacists has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. Independent prescribers now going to be social prescribing activities is, is the sort of new thing. I think that sh that's where it should head. Um, so that's really exciting. I think that's a really interesting point, Ranjita, about pharmacists and, and their role. And, and I wonder, because Marion's raised a question about, she says she's wondering about how all here are working with health commissioners beyond public health and to showcase the evidence of the impact of arts and health and or change the mindsets of what evidence matters, which also I think speaks to, to Julie's point about the need to embed participants and lived experience better within research in the evidence base. I wonder if you guys can respond to yeah, that. Yeah, I, I was going to say very briefly, um, 
what I've, I've just done, I've just got the green light in the last two weeks. I actually have now, <laughs> amongst other things, I have a very rare, rare heart condition. And so I was trogged along to what's called the heart failure clinic. And I thought this is a really a negative thing. So I had a discussion with my, um, my, my main clinician who actually runs the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. And it was over about a year period. And I realized that in actual drug wise, they can do nothing for me. So he, they actually admitted that. And I, I said, well, do you understand that going along, this is really negative because medically you can actually do nothing more you can support. So last couple of weeks ago, I saw him, had a consultation, had a chat, and he's actually green-lighted an initial research, um, art and research um, discussion about actually changing the name of the heart failure clinic at the trust. And it's going to be a whole thing to do with not just myself as patients, but actually clinicians and also the pharmacists, et cetera, et cetera, to really, and as I was talking to him, he really began to understand that I, I as, as a heart patient, okay, have huge amounts of my experience to bring to that clinic. And equally so does his clinicians. It's about how we work together to have something which is much more uplifting, if that makes any sense. So I always say to everybody that we as patients, going into any form of clinical setting. We are the ones with the most experience. And through that, we can then bring, as I always do, my, my sense of art and health, et cetera, into it. And all you have to do is ask. You might get a kickback, but I just say, keep asking and keep saying, this doesn't seem to be fit for purpose. And I'm sure, Helen, you'll get involved in that because it's just down the road from you. Sounds amazing, and I hope so. And I think, you know, that just showcases the, the real value that bringing the patient experience into all those different levels. And that's why, you know, I, I reeled off the whole list of all the different committees that Jilly's involved in. It's, it's, she's got such um, great energy and knowledge uh, and power that she brings to that. But uh, I guess that's also one route in terms of um, ensuring that that voice is heard, but also can bring about active change. And, yeah. and we'll just follow Gillian on all the brilliant work the LENS do. And we've got Ma Rana with us uh, here today. She's the, your new uh, co-director of the LENS. And um, so please do reach out to the LENS. If, it, if we've got researchers and practitioners here and you're not familiar with their work, um, we, Ma and I are working closely together on our research project at the minute, looking at community assets uh, used using during COVID. And it, it's, it's just really essential, I think. You beautifully articulated that, Julie. Ranjita, I wondered if you wanted to, to respond to that. Um, yes, thank, thank you. And uh, architecture in particular. Uh, oh, yes, it was sort of sort of about the lived experience. It's, you know, I mentioned earlier that it's it's sort of big, it's it's a very complex thing to share lived experience and to depending who the who the listener is, for what audience and what it can do. And I think um we, we talk a lot about it and maybe overuse of it as well and I'm sort of I have concerns about that about the duty of care for the sharer and, and also what the consequences what happens afterwards I know in many research studies even um, I'm doing a review in a study in Nepal actually uh, looking at uh, a meta-ethnography about participatory research that's been conducted and really how not really participatory they are and the viewpoints of some of the researchers some of them are on the west some of them are from Nepal and there's kind of a hierarchy a structure of all different types so it's not just about ethnicity there it's about caste it's about urban and rural spaces and and one, one study they had a, a woman that attended a meeting who was from um from, from a rapport caste and because she was there and but she wasn't really speaking and they considered that to be kind of participatory because they included somebody but she wasn't really included or part of anything really but that that's what I mean this kind of um, sort of tokenistic view which is very universal it's not just here so we can but at the same time in they have sort of women's group um, in Nepal who talk and they're very kind of um, vocal and expressive so some of them can be and uh, very knowledgeable about community but and we have some of the things in the UK as well so we can learn and share these kind of you know um, ideas and experiences and, and also the very lot of similarities you know small village in Nepal has something very similar and you know connection with people in Brixton there's there's this the way that things are done that all the conversations and people's concerns so I really like the idea of there are more connections in health and the arts sort of make those connections visible and also we live 
those kind of connections. So we're not just doing this in isolation. It's actually we have solutions and, and possibilities that are happening elsewhere. I think that's a really important point, Ranjita, that the tokenistic and that's, you know, that the work that Mar is leading on, uh, that we're doing research on at the minute is it really speaks to that. How can we really make sure that lived experience and participant experience is an active part of research? And, and I wondered if you could both sort of talk about your experiences and just ideas, really, partly because Mar and I are doing some research on this at the minute, which is how can we develop methods, adapt methods, develop new methods that really capture that in, in, you know, we've got, we've had some brilliant examples so far and um, from the work that you've done and Jumana and Arati and, and, and there's lots of examples of film and, and photo voice and storytelling. And I just wondered if you, if you could give your experiences of what you think works well and how you, um, how you think that's best embedded in research and how it can really be forefronted in research. Cause I, I agree often it's not and, and often it is tokenistic. I think it's really a lovely idea of process and exploring process. And when um, Errol presented his present presentation slides, you know, the, the idea of memory sort of archives and making some, some archival documents which are static alive, you know, that's just, just listening to that was quite inspiring. And I think sort of having sort of a space to focus on, on um, I, I feel with arts and health, there's so many things and creative health, so many things are happening at the same time. Um, just, um, I don't know if, um, I know there's research methods written on creative health, but I'm just sort of aware that it hasn't been collated and maybe something that Julie was sort of mentioning about, you know, having uh, more kind of a, like a network or a group that just, we can just focus on the process or there's a resource to go to where process is actually explored in a more expansive way rather than, this is the things you can do because with, with creative research, you know, the po point is it has lots of permutations and combinations with, with what you do one thing, it sort of filters and it kind of in inspires and embeds everywhere. It's like a really lovely kind of flourishing thing. So, um, and I think we probably haven't sort of, been, I don't know whether it's even to frame it, maybe creating a, like a, maybe it's framing or to grapple with it. I feel, we can need to have more, a little bit more clarity because it invites people in as well. It's not just those who are always doing it or always doing it. It's we want people, sort of new people to sort of, and then that's so important. Um, so I just see it as um, creating kind of kind of a, a form just for, just the exploration of process and, and the process of experience, the process of what is working and not working. That's so important to know. And, and different communities and cultures. It's almost like a, a resource I feel we need, like, like a, a, a hub, yes. Hub. Guys, I'm really sorry, I've got to wrap sorry. this up because we're out of time. We could listen to you all <laughs> there. And there's some really great comments and questions um, within the chat. So please, uh, Gillian and Ranjita, do have a look at those and respond accordingly. Thank you. Huge thank thanks you to Gillian and Ranjita. Such amazing discussions. Um, thank you very much. And I'm handing back to Lorna and then over to Thomas, I think. Yes, thank you. That was fascinating, Jilly, um, and fascinating, Ranjisa. Thank you. Uh, now we'll have Rochelle Burgess um, in conversation with Errol Francis, who returns to the scene. Uh, I'll hand you over to Thomas Kedor, who will introduce you. Hi, hi everyone, and, and th hi. thank you, Lorna. Um, uh, for for a great event, and as people have said in the chat, this the format of bringing people together in conversation is is really is really interesting and really inspiring, and and seeing the common threads coming out already that that link all of these conversations is also is also extremely interesting. So I I, I have no doubt that the next conversation between Rochelle Burgess and Errol Francis will fit the bill really nicely. Errol, you have already met. Um, so he's the artistic director of Culture and, and, and I'll put the, I think he might have already put the URL to his website into the chat. I can do that in a minute as well. And then we have, uh, speaking to Errol, we have Rochelle Burgess, who is a lecturer in global health at UCL, and she's also the director of the MSc in global health and development at, at, at UCL. Um, and also recently, Rochelle has been co-hosting the Public Health Disrupted Post podcast, uh, um, which I, again, I, I can put the, the link into the chat, which is fantastic. I think there are six or seven episodes where she's uh, 
partial in co conversation with Dr. San van Tulliken, but also have lots of interesting guests on. So I can, can warmly recommend that. Um, Rochelle is a, is a health psychologist uh, specializing in community-based approaches to health. So I think with that and her global health focus, it, it links really nicely in particular to, to the earlier conversation that, that, that we've had already, um, but I don't want to take up any more time. So since we've heard from Errol already, Rochelle, are you okay to make a start and just tell, tell us all a little bit about you and your work? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I, I must say when I got the invitation and the request, I sort of thought, really? Me? You, you, me? I, I don't but look at everybody else. And <laughs> you want me to talk to Errol? What? Um, so that I had to sort of calm myself down and sort of really sort of try and remember, I suppose in a way who I am and a bit about what drives me in my work. So you sort of said that, um, you've sort of said to everyone already that I am a uh, health psychologist, but I'm specifically, I'm a community health psychologist. And what this ultimately means is that I'm very interested in understanding processes of engagement, participation, ownership, and power, and how that relates to the process of creating health enabling environments for marginalized groups all over the world. As uh, a black woman who is a migrant and a descendant from um, sort of slaves in the Caribbean and a first generation, to go to university and my family. There are various ways in which I have experienced various multiple axes of oppression in my life. And the ways in which I survived that growing up, moving into the academy, which for lack of a better word, is not a nice place to be often if you are a person of color. And I imagine that people who have done this before me like Errol can speak to that legacy much more than I can. Um, but you know the numbers around um, black female professors in this country are enough to tell you that the space is not particularly welcoming um, in many ways. And the ways in which I've got through that have always been through the arts. One of my favorite podcasts that we did was with, with Helen um, and um, that was, I think, the fifth podcast, and we sort of <laughs> talked about how, I guess in that podcast, I sort of really started to remember that actually I was first an artist and then an activist, and then tried to make those things work as a researcher, as a way of sort of elevating stories of people who aren't uh, typically listened to or engaged with um, voices that are marginalized, um, that are silenced against very, through various pathways and platforms, um, the double and triple and quadruple marginalization that happens to health service users depending on their other axes of oppression that they carry in their embodied persons. And I just really felt that using creative methodologies was, all, was not just a way to tell people's stories better and to honor their stories better, but also created pathways to make research transformative in and of itself. So working in global health is a very sort of long-term game of thinking about how you fight sort of structural uh, oppression and inequalities between countries and how that trickles down into people's everyday lives. And the way in which I found I could survive the, that long-term process was ultimately through using methods that when people participated in them, so through um, photo voice, through storytelling, through um, um, sort of other different types of creative methods that I've used in the past, the process of producing and creating and remembering your story and your place in the world becomes, the, becomes an empowering process for people. And it sort of helped me feel that I could live with the imperfections of the research space as a whole. And I guess over time, over the last sort of few years, as I've done more work in the UK, particularly around Black African and Black Caribbean mental health inequalities in London, I found that those stories are exactly the same. The methods bring the same sort of power to the people 
whose stories we are trying to elevate into the spaces of policy for meaningful action and change, um, but also in and of themselves for what it, they do to what they do for people. Um, and so it's just been really nice to sort of hear all these themes brought up by, by so many of the previous speakers that just resonate so strongly with the work that I've been doing over the years and sort of wondering really if UCL was a place where I could explore these things deeper. And so it's been nice to sort of see that, to find my people, I suppose, in a way. Um, so it's been really, really exciting. And what just sort of an honor and a pleasure to be able to speak with, with Errol, who when I was doing a bit of background Googling about, I realized that we are both sort of critical Foucauldian power scholars back in the day. <laughs> and that just like my, made me even happier. Um, uh, and, and also that your sort of original medium was around photography, which is something that's a very deep, deep passion of mine. My working in, with photo voice methods in Colombia sort of speaks to that desire of how we sort of tell our story through the way that we share the images about our lives. So anyway, I, I, I guess that's it. I don't want to say any more. I'd rather hear some more about, about Errol's work and sort of maybe if anything that I've sort of just blabbered about <laughs> sort of resonates with, with you and the work you've done in the past or what you're doing now and, and, and moving ahead. Thanks yeah, so much. <laughs> yeah, I hand the shade over to, to Errol. So, so sorry, Errol. Just um, actually a housekeeping thing yeah. behind the scenes, the panelists have been discussing that maybe people could do with a break. So we will try and wrap our session up a, a five minutes earlier, um, at 10 past. So people have a, a five minute break before the next session. Um, so sorry for the interruption with, with something very boring. But Errol, can I, can I hand, mm -hmm. hand over to you to respond? Thank you, Thomas. And um, it's a, a real delight to have this conversation with you, Rochelle. Um, and um, we share so much. I mean, um, in what you said about uh, personal experience of being in academia, um, being um, the first person in my family to have this particular path, you know, in academia. And of course, the Foucault thing, I mean, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I spent years at UCL poring over one short essay that he wrote trying to sort of interpret this and its relevant. So I, I really do um, find his work inspiring actually. And although um, one of the struggles I had with my supervisor was his actual silence on the question of race, even though um, the work is applicable, that was one of the issues, but anyway, um, uh, what you say about arts and health um, and activism, I also, um, that really does inform my work. And um, uh, in terms of my approach to arts and health, it was a, a combination of activism really that started this work. I mean, I, I didn't have time to say this. So, um, I, I, I used to work in the National Health Service um, and uh, I worked in the mental health field and I was, really an advocate for um, addressing the racialization of black people really in the mental health system, going back, uh, of course, to slavery and the manifestation of that in terrible things, actually. Uh, I, I could tell you that um, I, I couldn't, I have not been able to watch the um, video about George Floyd. And the reason I couldn't watch it is because it basically re-traumatized um, uh, and re-activated uh, experiences that I had um, here in the UK because what happened to him, um, you know, is virtually identical to what happened to so many black men in the mental health system in the UK. And uh, uh, um, yeah, um, th that informs my, uh, attitude to arts and health and in fact it started it was because of a real dissatisfaction with what we were doing for people when I worked in the NHS that I started doing collaborative arts projects with the patients um, with photography um, um, so um, yeah and, and this, this, that's what informs the kind of interest in mental health which has continued in my work but it does I guess place one in a kind of adversarial position in relation to 
discourse, but also institutions and their practice. Um, and I think art for me is a one way of, of getting between those discourses in a way to, especially medical uh, discourse around concepts of illness and health. And I think art is one of those um, practices that really has the potential to open up those problematics around what do we mean by health and, and, and well-being. Um, A hundred percent. And it's sort of, you know, in Ranjita and, and Jilly's conversation previously, they were sort of talking about um, the ways in which um, different languages are, are spoken. And I just sort of find that I'm in full agreement with the fact that the arts creates new ways of portraying the same thing in a different language, right? And in, in, in the ways that there is so, I mean, I think the health field is just rife with epistemic violence, which is for, for those who are unfamiliar with the term is the idea that is the sort of erasure of people's knowledge systems and the violence that that enacts when we don't hear what people are saying or the stories that they're bringing. And as Errol, my fellow Foucauldian will know, we sort of exist in these disciplinary silos all the time that sort of really limit us from hearing each other. Even though we think we're talking about the same things, we can't, we can't hear it. And so what arts does, I often find, is becomes that great leveler. Um, it sort of can take away the fact that this person has a PhD and this person doesn't. Um, it takes away the fact that this person has not experienced um, has experienced one type of trauma and this person experienced a different type of trauma that is more intergeneration, intergenerational and, and, and embedded across sort of family lifetimes and, 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 and households and, and generations beyond what they can count. Um, and I just feel that there is such, I suppose, power and, and beauty in that. And there's this, there's this quote by um, Audre Lorde that I just hopefully people won't mind if I read it because she's another sort of critical scholar um, from, she's from the US, she was from the US and she's written quite extensively about power and race and gender and their intersections. And one of her favorite essays of mine is called Poetry is Not a Luxury. And I have taken to quoting <laughs> Audre Lorde in as many of my publications in peer reviewed journals as I possibly can as a way of trying sort of inserting these sort of like levelers for people who might read across fields or disciplines. And there's one um, piece that just sort of resonates with me and reminds me about what we're trying to do with art and the transformative power of art. Um, and so she says, as they become known to and accepted by us, our feelings and the honest exploration of them become sanctuaries and spawning grounds for the most radical and daring of ideas. And so the idea that she here is talking about poetry as, as, a, as a vehicle or a mechanism to in, have people engaged with their feelings and, and sort of what they experience. And as it, it becomes sort of the stepping stone to sort of radical change. And that to me is how I see the value and the purpose of arts within work, that it becomes the stepping stones, maybe within one study, all we're able to do is get young people together to sort of do story creation. But what happens to those young people in the process of that is the start of something that we potentially are able to facilitate through other forms of engagement that are more long term. Um, and just sort of really seeing, and maybe it's sort of speaking to one of the questions that Ranjita spoke to, sort of how do we, how do we get at methods and think about methods and processes in a different way. I think it's actually about moving our thinking away from the method itself but to the paradigms within a method within which a method is situated. Because you can do a focus group or a poetry workshop and it doesn't mean anything, it doesn't go anywhere unless the desire behind why you're doing that method has an aspiration for transformation. And these paradigms exist. One of the things that we often struggle with is thinking outside our disciplinary boundaries. And I, and I try to fight that as much as possible and came across the work of um, Donna Mertens who is a South African scholar who writes about transformative research methodologies and 
participatory action research, which I saw Errol on one of your slides, is some a method you use is embodied within this desire to be participatory and, and transformative and really seeing participation as a route to transformation. That is how it avoids becoming tokenistic. Um, and it's something I sort of write about all the time, um, but nobody reads my work because I'm young and, <laughs> and not really that important yet. So maybe one day. <laughs> But I mean, Errol, I'd love to sort of hear about how you have been using participatory action research um, at Culture and, and and sort of what that has looked well, like. Well, actually, that I can't claim uh, credit for because I'm, the project, the Culture Box project is being done with um, the University of Exeter. And so the bit about the participatory action research is the, um, it's an AHRC funded project. So it's the, um, the, the, the psychologists on the team who are using that method to um, look at how these cultural materials are being received by the care homes um, that, that we're working with. Um, um, but I, I wanted to go back to a couple of the comments that you've you made though that are so important, I think. Um, first of all, epistemic violence, which um, for people in the audience who, who may not have come across this, uh, what we're talking about is um, a phrase that was coined by uh, Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, who was, who is um, a post-colonial scholar, and um, uh, I think it's from Can the Subaltern Speak, where she's talking about the way that Western discourse silences and others, um, uh, people uh, from um, uh, people who've been racialized, and uh, it's the operation of discourse, the the silence of discourse, and the way that othering works in um, Western knowledge um, uh, that we're referring to. And um, actually this phrase uh, has come up in the past year in the museum sector, um, specifically um, in relation to this sort of, um, uh, the, the, the kind of um, imperial narratives that we encounter within heritage institutions, the way that black experience is, is, um, is, 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 is um, uh, regarded or, um, written about by dominant uh, discourses um, but uh, also I wanted to touch on what you said about art and the potential of art because it, um, in our work at Culture and it's like a real contradiction because on the one hand there is this potential of creative practice to um, I think open up um, individual and collective experience in a way that medical discourse isn't able to do and I really experienced this firsthand when I worked in, um, in mental health and psychiatry and the way that the black experience, um, you know, whether it was um, individuals or communities was not admissible, you know, it didn't fit into the dominant medical discourse about what is a mental illness and who, what these symptoms are, how we can diagnose them in, in particular people. And so art had the potential to open up what I think is the, the individual testimony, um, the unique voice, if you like, which in, you know, if in, in um, medical science can only be answered through randomized controlled trials, you know, that, so there's this, um, going back to Foucault, regimes of truth in the way that uh, experience is, is um, um, uh, understood. And yet in the art world, and um, whether I'm, I'm talking about the cultural institutions, they are, and to have moved actually from the health service into the art, I would I would actually find them probably more elite and um, exclusive than the medical hierarchies that I was working with, which is a real kind of contradiction in the way that the art sector retains a kind of um, elitism and social exclusivity. And so whilst we have this potential for a, um, opening up of experience through creative practice, we are still coming up against a set of institutional structures that are in themselves uh, entrenched in um, white supremacy, actually, is what I would call it. So it's a real push and pull um, experience. <laughs> I don't know what you think of that. Um, yeah, no, I can totally, I can totally see that. I mean, there was something that you said in your introductory talk that sort of really um, stuck with me actually is about sort of the um, the sort of underrepresentation of, of 
black people and people of color within um, the classical arts. And, and one of the thing, I, and the podcast, every podcast I tell some sort of embarrassing secret about myself. And then the, the one um, with Helen, it wasn't really an embarrassing secret, but I sort of let the secret go that I sing. And one of the things that always happens is people sort of look at me and they assume a certain, I do a certain type of singing. But I'm actually classically trained and I um, sang in classical operas and I sing in multiple languages. And one of the things that really hindered me from pushing that further when I was young is that I was always the only person who looked like me in those spaces. And there was this, people had a difficulty in sort of knowing what to do with my voice, sort of the, my voice was too deep to be sort of a regular mezzo um, or, you know, there's not a lot of sort of alto solo pieces. At some point, my voice was so low that I could sing tenor parts. And so really sort of people just, I couldn't fit into the idea of what operatic singing looked like. And because I couldn't, I didn't see how I fit and because people didn't think I fit, I just left. And, you know, over time, I, I noticed the way in which not being able to sort of live that part of myself had an impact on my emotional and mental well-being and you know eventually went back to sort of choral singing and um within sort of those types of choirs when i moved here and it was really wonderful and fulfilling and and beautiful um and you know in those spaces i am the only i am one of two or the only sort of black person in my choir there's one black alto one black soprano and you know we don't it's the face it doesn't as you say the that the i suppose the the infrastructure around the arts is the same around all of these big institutions is that there's an idea of who is in and who is out and the impact that that has on people sort of ability to participate in those spaces is the thing that we must always be seeking to understand and to combat and you know there's now these whole movements about sort of like black in the opera and i just sort of wish oh 20 years ago i would have been an opera singer for sure i had perfect pitch who has perfect pitch nobody has perfect pitch i did <laughs> well i'm glad you let out that secret because <laughs> I, let's talk about the anxiety fanfare and get that voice going again because I'd love to. I, yes. I think it's uh, it's really exciting and I mean what I was saying about the uh, working on that piece of music um, was precisely to address some of the questions that you are um, talking about. You know, an elite art form like opera and um, you know classical music. Who's in? Who's out? How can we make this work for our experience? You know, and um, uh, I, I, I see no um, um, what, what should I say um, contradiction actually between you know being a you know an academic or you know being a singer and, and I think that's really interesting, and so um, yeah I, I share your passion in music and um, I have to say that um, I think um, uh, uh, Black American um opera singers i found the most inspirational in the sense of how they've broken through these barriers uh, mm -hmm. jesse milton norman was my absolute favorite um singer and very often it would be me and jesse norman as the only people of color in the auditorium and mm -hmm. <laughs> she's singing and me listening you know yeah. and so yeah um uh, i i see so much potential in even these um elite art forms in um, disrupting them and getting them to address an experience for which they perhaps were not designed. <laughs> I think that's very exciting. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, it reminds me of um, sort of W.E.B. Du Bois sort of like first sort of his big sort of writing sort of like the souls of black folk. Every chapter begins with a piece of spiritual music and just sort of as the way of sort of anchoring how Black people at that time, people of color, people, the sort of the majority world, the, the world sort of makes sense of themselves through music sometimes and sort of is able to express parts of themselves that they are not able to do otherwise through sort of regular worlds, the sort of full and sort of embodiment of it. Um, and, you know, as I talk about singing, I get goosebumps. And that's another sort of way in which my body connects to my brain that you know when I sort of speak things that are really important I get 
I guess, goosebumps, but I really feel that um, different modalities like music and, and arts make help deepen those connections between, between this part of the self that we can't touch and the world out there that is tangible and, and lived in. Yeah. Um, Okay, great. Thank, Even, thank, so, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I, I was wondering if we should move to some of the questions, but yeah, if you want to respond okay. quickly, that's fine. Okay, no, no, I'm just following up what Rochelle says about the, the potential of music to address things that cannot be expressed in, in, in um, language, um, in, 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 in speech. And um, even though I'm trained as a visual artist, I often return to music to uh, address experiences for, that I cannot visualize, I cannot speak uh, um, in words. But yes, let's let's move on to the questions. <laughs> and uh, there, there, there's one question that actually came in at the very end of, of the previous session from Marion, but I think it, uh, it it might work here as well because it relates quite nicely to the point that you made, Errol, earlier about the institution of the arts and how that's even more infested with white privilege potentially than the health service, right? Um, and, and the questions about publication and how the mainstream medical media, uh, whatever we take take that to mean, is still obviously prioritizing what's seen as as traditional biomedical models, and and what are the options of getting the mainstream media to listen to us coming from alternative perspectives? But but then I think is there a challenge there? Just to add, this is not in the question. That was the, that was the question. But is there a challenge there that we are potentially replacing one very hierarchical um, institution with another? If if you if you if you're saying this is about the arts, the way the art sector is operating at the moment, is there actually something a paradigm shift required even within the arts before we can talk about having that accepted within the medical media? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the short answer is yes to that, in, in the sense that, yes, the, the, it is another hierarchical um, set of institutions and, and discourses, if you like, but there's a very important um, question, if you like, or problematic that we have to address in the arts, which actually carries over into um, um, medicine. Um, I was always fascinated by... Um, um, one of uh, one of Shakespeare's plays, uh, *The Tempest*. I think it's an extraordinary play because of the way that race is actually articulated in this play. And there's there's a kind of clash to me, my interpretation of the play, it, a clash of civilization. You know, it's this encounter. These these white people suddenly end up on this island and um, encounter the other. Right now. Um, I think there is a, a, a conception of the other in um, medical discourse, and particularly the field that I was working in in psychiatry, concepts of danger, who is most threatening, who is most likely to be psychotic, these sorts of things that are also embedded within the arts. And there's a question about civilization as well, a big question about civilization that also impacts on medicine. And when I walk into the British Museum, and I see that Egypt is separated from the continent of Africa in the classification. That is a huge cultural question that actually impacts on when, um, a, you know, um, the, how a, the behavior of a patient in a clinical setting is regarded. Is this behavior civilized, acceptable behavior? How should we interpret it? I see a connection between those things. So whilst it's, it's an elite um, institution, it's one that we have to battle with. We have to struggle with it. We have to fight with it and make interventions that disrupt these assumptions. And I think that um, what's exciting about going back to UCL, the, the MASC, is that there's a potential for this collision to happen, arts and science within a in an academic discipline. So, so no, we, we can't shy away from the hierarchy and the the elitism. We we need to 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 um, tackle it. Um, Perfect. Thank you, Rochelle. Would you like to respond to this one as well? Yeah, I mean, I just I totally agree. I think if you don't if you assume that one modality is automatically more um, fair or equal than others, then you're, that's just, you're, you're cutting yourself off at the knees before you start. Power, I, I mean, I think, and this is one of my bugbears that I think people 
don't have adequate conceptualizations in general, in general about how power is at work in their lives. And once people and societies as a whole come to, to recognize that, it changes everything because literally every institution is set up in a way to function, to hold power away from most of the people. So moving from one discipline to another does not automatically mean some transformation happens. Some of the questions I often get about sort of, oh, we're gonna use qualitative methods to be more inclusive. And I say, that doesn't mean anything. If you're making the questions and you didn't ask anybody, how inclusive is that? You still hold all the power. So there is the, there's these sort of assumptions that happen in sort of the medical field in particular, but Ed, you know, any sort of field, I sort of saw there was another question in the Q&A from, from Mecca, sorry if I'm not I'm just, or pronouncing it correctly, about law. And I mean, I think there are, every discipline has its structures, but also every discipline has its um, points of fracture or the cracks, you know, like, is it Leonard Cohen? There's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. And, you know, every space that you're trying to disrupt has a crack. There's a, a way in which something is presented or organized that allows you to shift a conversation. And it's about sort of having a chance and an opportunity to do that deep dive into the practices of your organization, into the practices of your institution to find where those cracks are. And for me, that's where your transformative work begins. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and and as a as a publishing uh, as an author, and I, I haven't actually mentioned you've just brought a book out as well. I think in global health, right? Or is is about about, about come on. so? Um, what is that balance then? Is it is the mainstream media the key vehicle that we should be aiming at of getting these messages out? Is it the academic literature, or is it something completely different? I think. I think it's, and this is something that always frustrates people, but I always say it's not either or, it's all of them. So you need to have action on all of those points all at the same time, or there will be no mobility or movement. So for example, if you were to um, think about sort of how you disrupt um, the journal paradigm, sometimes you disrupt it by creating new platforms. And so the, the whole, idea about sort of open science is one way in which that's being disrupted to sort of open to open the access to, to this material to everyone. But then the, the next level is also to present your work in ways that are consumable by everyone. And that is, you know, the next sort of ways in which we can disrupt power at that space. Because if you imagine that the academy works in a way where all of our progression is based on publishing in the right journals, if we're not doing work there, then that part never changes. Even if we're all sort of being told to have social media profiles and I go out there and start singing in the streets or all these sorts of things, my ability to hold power in the institution where I'm situated still, defend, still depends on me reifying um, oppression through the modes of production of my work. So even if the work itself is transformational, I have to write about it in a certain way in order for it to get into a certain journal and it can't be too long and you can't have too many quotes. And you know, in the book that I am almost finished, I couldn't use the picture I wanted to because it had to be a particular cover that fit with the series. And I couldn't, you know, there's all these boundaries on the way in which we, we work. And so you need to be moving against all of those different platforms at once, I think in order, and, and not everybody does it, you know, we all take a different yes. view of the Yes. Of the yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, uh, Rochelle. Somebody in the to chat has mentioned um, Suman Fernando, and he's a colleague that I've worked with for a long time. And the way he writes, and the comment by Umera um, Iqbal is how accessible his writing is. And I, I think that this the whole story about black mental health in this um, in the UK is as an example of that multi-level intervention, Rochelle, that you're talking about in terms of people doing academic work and research and um, also popular discourse, if you like, if you want to call it that way, your non-academic discourse. Um, and I, I, just over the last few weeks, I sort of, it brought a wry smile, um, actually, as, as it were, the kind of 
effect of that. And it was the response to the race disparity report that the government published, that appalling uh, report. And uh, I was amazed when I read the Royal College of Psychiatrists response to this, so challenging the, the Royal College, challenging the government and saying that um, uh, there's a social model of mental health and yes, there, are, there is discrimination. And I was thinking, really, this, this is the Royal College that we used to battle against, right? To say, recognize this. And I, I think that, uh, you know, there are still disparities in mental health, but at the level of discourse, I think there has been a paradigm shift to have seen that statement from the Royal College. So I, I totally agree with you. You can't be intervening at one level or using one type of language or discourse. Yeah, and I feel that those discursive changes are often the cracks, sort of even if they're just sort of like illusory. So they write this sort of like, we believe in this. Then you say, oh yeah, okay, we'll prove it. That means you need to fund this and you need to do this and you need to do this. And for me, I always think those are the cracks I look for. I think how is this discourse or this space and this structure talking about these things? Are they talking about them in ways that give me an in? And so, you know, like you, I, my jaw sort of hit the floor. I thought psychiatry would have been last to that party of critiquing that report, but they were first. So I, I, I thought, you know, that, that's, that to me was amazing. Um, yeah, it really was. Okay, um, seeing as it's almost almost 10 past and I've promised a five minute break, I think I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna cl close the, the session there. Thank you so much for a really inspiring debate. You can see the comments in the chat as well. People have found that that really amazing and, and, and interesting. And um, just before I go, I realized my major faux pas that I didn't introduce myself at the start. I mean, people can see my name, I, I, I'm Thomas. I am a lecturer in creative health at UCL and together with Helen, um, and 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 soon to be Ranchita, we are gonna lead on the on the mass creative health that that Errol has mentioned. Just just to have that that boxed off as well, that people are wondering who is this guy uh, leading the session. So this this is me, and thank you so much. So we'll take a five minute break, please, if you can stay on the call rather than having problems logging back in, and just uh, in uh, just mute yourself and and stretch your legs for five minutes, and we see you promptly at quarter past one. Thank you, Errol, Errol and thank thank you, Rochelle. Thanks. Thanks, Thomas. That was great. And thanks, everyone, for having, having me. Thank you, Rochelle. That was a pleasure. Yeah. I'll be bothering you a lot, Errol. Don't worry. I've, I've sent you my email, okay? <laughs> so now I shall hand over to Nina Koch, who is going to chair our next conversation uh, between Priyanka Chauhan and Latoya Jill. Over to you, Nina. Thanks, Lorna. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, hope you're enjoying the event. Um, I'm Nina Quash, Head of Programs for the Grand Challenges of Global Health and Human Wellbeing at UCL. And I'm very pleased to introduce our next panelists, Priyanka Chuan and Latoya Gill. Priyanka is an inclusive dance practitioner and community arts producer with a focus on wellbeing. She's also the community coordinator at the Union Chapel and has worked closely with the team on their creative community work through the pandemic. Latoya is one of Union Chapel's creative community leaders, a group of people from the local community who have been training in creative facilitation skills. She's passionate about challenging systemic injustices and the place of, an, and the place of art in socio-political change. So welcome both and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I'd just like to remind the audience that you can ask questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, but can I ask by, uh, can I start by asking the panelists, um, can you tell us a little bit more about your work at the Union Chapel and particularly about the role of creativity in your work? Um, Priyanka, would you like to start? Yeah, definitely. Uh, hi, everyone. Oh, I just realized my laundry's in the back. Let me, <laughs> let me shift to the side. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I just also want to say that Michael Chandler was meant to be in my position. He's a CEO of Union Chapel. So I'm stepping in, in for him today and I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the amount of talent and training that's in this platform. So uh, really grateful just to be here and hopefully I can kind of give something of value to you all. But um, yeah, thanks for having us. Um, 
so yeah, I am the community coordinator at Union Chapel and I've been there since the end of uh, last year, so like November time. So not been there long, I'm a part-time member of staff there as well. So it's been a very, um, feels short, but we've done a lot of work um, in this period with them. And um, so my role there is to kind of work with them and engage more of the community, local community groups that are in the area of North London, Islington, and also different members of the community and try and find creative ways and creative programs to deliver and just help on the kind of delivery facilitation and management side of that. Um, and that's why Latoya is here. Latoya is one of our uh, creative leaders that's been in our leadership training course. And I'll let Latoya um, talk a little bit about that and her role at Union Chapel. Hi everybody. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite a pleasure to be here today and just to listen to everyone's passions um, related to art and creativity. Um, so yeah, I'm a creative community leader at Union Chapel and um, I just received, the time I spent in Union, at the Union Chapel was a traineeship, um, a traineeship to be a creative community leader. Um, and what we did was we used, um, we used a practice called legislative theatre, which falls under um, theatre, sorry, one sec, which falls under the theatre of, of the oppressed, which was um, a practice um, thought of by a guy called Augustus Bow. And what we did is that we, as a group, we thought about different social issues that were important to us. Um, and we came up with three. Um, those being homelessness, mental health, and sexism within the arts. Um, and our aim was to put on or devise uh, some scenes that, would, that we would then present to um, other members of the community and also policy makers, such as some Islington councillors and um, some other representatives from other organisations. Um, so we put the scenes together and we presented um, and it was a really exciting um, experience um, because the policy makers actually listened and took on board what we had to say, um, you know, from people's lived experiences. Um, and so they've gone away and they've um, said that they're going to try and review some of the policies they have in order to um, adapt to these social issues that we explored. Um, yeah. Thanks for this. Um, I have so many questions ready. But um, <laughs> can I start by asking you, um, in my experience of talking and asking people about creativity, a lot of people think or have thought at some point in their lives that they're not creative and arts is not for them. Um, and I suppose this feeling is even starker in people who have been marginalized and feel like arts is an elitist practice, as Errol and Rochelle have. Um, touched on a little bit earlier. In your work of working with homeless people, for instance, have you encountered that sort of resistance or hesitation? And how do you help people through that block? So um, with the legislative theatre, we didn't actually, I didn't actually work with um, some homeless people. We used the experience, although as a group, we used the experience of people from the group. So. Um, when I think about creativity and whether everyone can be creative, I think everyone is born creative um, in the sense that you make something, you think about something, you visualize something and you could bring it into practice, whether that's, you know, wanting to make a, a to piece of toast and then you know, making it happen. It doesn't have to be an artwork that everyone, you know, muses over. So, um, but what I did, what one of the things I did learn in um, the whole experience and that I, that I have taken on board is just the idea of the mechanization, which was one of the, um, it was a concept that uh, Paolo Freire thought of. He, he wrote this book called uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And it talks about um, how when we are educated, um, we, the model, the standard model uses this banking system so it's it, it, it which works on a hierarchy where the teachers are the, the people that hold the knowledge and the students don't know anything. So what mm -hmm. um, 
what Paolo Ferrer did was that he reversed that assumption and he um, thought about it on a horizontal point of view where both the teacher and the student could learn from each other. And what the uh, teacher did was to pose problem questions, which they um, encouraged the students to kind of um, explore. And that's a way of learning. Um, so this whole demechanization thing um, concept really stuck with me this whole um, experience um, at the Union Chapel. And I think in terms of creativity, it's just remembering that creativity is in you and it's only a certain set of society where uh, creativity or thinking creativity is encouraged. And it's and the work that I am doing following on from um, Union Chapel is to go into or work with um, groups where um, creativity is not necessarily encouraged, where they've lost it. So just where they, or I want to work with the younger generation where they, it's still there, but they're on the brink of it being lost. So um, yeah, I, yeah. Thanks, Latoya. Uh, Priyanka, do you have any thoughts on um, the topic? Yeah, definitely. So, um, so I'll talk about kind of a previous experience at another theatre, Jackson's Lane Theatre, uh, where I ran a kind of three year programme called Women Rise. Um, and Jackson's Lane is known for kind of modern circus. And um, the groups that I, I was working with were older women, so women over 55. And when you think of, if you've never worked, similar to me, I'd never done any circus in my life. Um, even though I'm a dancer, so I'm in that space. But even when I thought of circus, I was thinking, what am I going to do? You know, I can't, I can't walk on a tightrope. I just all those kind of assumptions that you have about circus. But actually, when you go into um, a creative space where it's, it's a quite inclusive circus, so you're doing things like juggling, and, and that's amazing for your coordination, um, playing with kind of feathers and scarves, there's all the sensory, and just there's so much that goes on with the, the, the kind of acro balance and all that kind of stuff. Um, but as someone that's never really, so I kind of experienced that as someone that's never experienced circus, but someone that's not experienced any kind of creativity or been in that space, like you say, it seems very not my space to be in. Trying to uh, sell it per se, or trying to get people to come in and try out this form of circus that is inclusive and that is for your well-being and has other impacts rather than just performance space. It's more about, like I think mentioned before, the process of being in this space with other people, doing creative things and finding the, the benefits that happen within that space. So there are definitely barriers around like which art form you choose to use. So some people maybe think that maybe creative writing is a bit more accessible for them, but physical things like dance, for example, as, a, as an inclusive dance practitioner, using the word dance, you can think, I can't dance, I have two left feet, or, you know, I, I don't perform on stage and that's not my goal, but I'm, I'm all about kind of in the moment, in the process of just learning different routines together, moving in the same joint rhythms and um, sharing that experience together is really valuable. So I think the language we use, which I think we spoke about earlier as well, is super important. So kind of, Firstly, letting people try it out. I think that's always a beneficial thing. I used to just bring circus with me wherever I went. So I used to have a lady that come with me and just show off the juggling skills. And once you've tried it in a way that is accessible to you and actually feels inclusive and feels, feels relevant to you, um, you're more likely to come back and more likely to try out. So there is definitely barriers there. Um, and I think that's for a mix of art forms and a mix of different groups, the, the barriers are very different. So um, yeah, I hope that answered the question, yeah. I'm wondering about how to further break down those barriers and silos and uh, encourage inclusive and, you know, multifaceted conversation um, and exchanges between people, regardless of their role, their age, you know, you've both mentioned working with younger people, but as well as older people who are learning a skill for the first time, and perhaps feel like they have less to contribute than, you know, the teacher or the person who's teaching, um, how do we encourage that inclusive conversation and sharing of life experiences as well as skills and creativity? Yeah, um, I, I'd say it's um, the way that you facilitate a session I think is super important. So I think that's where the facilitation skills that we do, for example, the leaders group with the Toya is, is really key. So if I was to deliver a session, a dance-based session, um, and I went in with this idea that I have all the knowledge and the best dance skill is just not going to happen because as soon as I come into a space I know I'm going to learn so much from other people and the movements that they're going to bring the the ideas and the, the way that they tell stories it's, it's all about having a 
joint conversation, similar to what Latoya was talking about, having that um, we're not one person over the top of the other. It's the whole idea of power and control as well. So we're coming in as a space together to enjoy this creative process, not to come in as this is the outcome and this is what I want from you and that's the end all. It's all about coming together and using this creative process, whether it be circus, art, dance, creative writing as a tool for conversation or as a tool for um, dialogue and expression of our emotions and stuff like that. So as long as people, I think, firstly, trust for you, is it, for trust for you as a facilitator is important, but also the language you use. So when I used to do kind of flyers per se, or, or however you want to market material, it's talking about how the movement, movement for finding joy or uh, finding a way to express yourself. We're just using, breaking down what dance means for different mm -hmm. people, explaining what we mean as dance or what we mean as theatre when we're doing it online for a group in the community and stuff like that. So language is key and also trust in the facilitation and coming in as a facilitator that is ready to, to learn from, from everyone in that space and using it as a tool rather than um, trying to perfect the art per se. Mm. Yeah. I, I definitely um, agree with that in terms of using art as a tool and to um, kind of encourage conversation. I think when you're working with people that don't necessarily use art in everyday life, it, it's, it's a good idea to create a safe space for them and to understand where they are coming from. And then um, just through conversation and, and to not really to infiltrate the group, just to be there as a vessel to allow them to open up and express. And when they do start to open up, then you'll probably start to notice areas where they are, can be creative or um, want to express. And it's through that um, building of a safe space and conversations and, and being amongst the group rather than being on top of the group with, as you know, the person with all the knowledge and, and, and the expertise, um, I think that will allow people to open up and, and it will empower them to, um, express in ways that they probably don't even think that they are capable of, probably don't think they're even capable of doing. Definitely. Also an interesting, um, an interesting story. Um, I used to, my first role was as a domestic violence um, group worker, they called it. So kind of running confidence building sessions, but also awareness training sessions um, for younger people, for women that have experienced abuse and stuff like that. So. I was very much kind of frontline per se, but talking about heavy issues and trying to raise awareness about it and trying to trying to, trying to engage in that conversation more. But it was there was no creativity put really that was involved. Mm -hmm. I started to bring in a little bit towards the end of my role there, but initially it was very PowerPoint slide. This is what we're talking about. Here are the stats kind of thing, and this is where you can go. It was very formal. Um, but my recent role at uh, Jackson's Lane was using forum theatre to talk about domestic abuse and how to gain support or how to even have that conversation or you know just just exploring that idea but using using interactive theatre mm -hmm. and the 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 amount of conversation and the amount of disclosures mm -hmm. that came from using the theatre method rather than me just talking about it was huge and just seeing the impact over that over the course of three years in amongst a different range of community saying housing projects and stuff like that it was amazing just to see the impact of that so as much as we come in with facilitation skills and stuff like that. The, just having the vessel of drama and interactive drama to carry the room and carry a safe space um, was super powerful. So I think using the tools in the right way can really facilitate conversation and make people feel like they can engage with that art form and then engage in conversation, difficult conversation as a result of it. So, yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting to hear about how creativity can help beyond um, improving individuals' lives and well-being, but actually how um, it's a force for creating um, thriving and inclusive communities. Um, and I wanted to ask a little bit more about long-lasting societal change, how um, you've used that um, sort of, you, you've mentioned earlier, uh, talking to policymakers and trying to um, communicate about the work that you're doing um, and so what role does the art play in how you approach that? So um, following on from the legislative theatre um, project I done with the Union Chapel um, I'm now working with the Union Chapel to put on a workshop and the workshop I'm going to do is um, called See Scene and 
um, what I want to do is work with young kids to um, use art to explore identity. Um, so I want, going back to the whole demechanization, um, the aim is to allow them to analyze the narrative that is out there about, for example, marginalized youth or disadvantaged youth, and to get them to to understand that the narrative isn't necessarily absolute and they shape their own identity. And the idea is that for me, and the reason why I wanted to go into it is that it's, it's very hard to let go of everything that you feel is, is, is truth. The moment we're born, we're bombarded with um, images and narratives. There's only one version of the truth. And what I wanna do with this workshop is to open the up or allow the kids to explore this idea that they don't have to accept the narrative that's been placed on them. And through, and through um, that discovery, they will allow, they will be reminded of the creativity that they already have inside them, which will allow them to um, analyze and problem solve and think outside of the box and, and just to have this sense of self um, that comes from um, navigating through the world, through different opinions, through different um, ideologies, and through different narratives. So they can break outside of the label that's been placed upon them. And I think, I really do think prevention is better than cure, which is why I want to work with um, young kids before they begin to accept the labels that are placed upon them. And hopefully when they do, bef when they, when they um, what they get out from a workshop such as that would, be that they take this forward and begin to analyze everything that they, or at least challenge the narrative that they um, see or has been presented to them. And they can use that way of thinking to navigate through the world and push through um, barriers as, as much as they can. Um, but yeah, definitely prevention is cure and to, to get people creatively stimulated whilst they still have them. Thank you, uh, Priyanka. Would you like to share your thoughts? Yeah, so in terms of kind of longer term, possibly structural impacts that we can have in our kind of community artwork. Um, so like Latoya mentioned, what the project that we had with the community leaders was uh, working with a wonderful facilitator, Katie Rubin, who um, works in the legislative theatre format, both in New York, and she's been doing it here in, in Manchester as well. Um, particularly around homelessness and um, legislative theatre really engages with policy makers so um, the interactive theatre happens and then from the interactive theatre the audience creates uh, changes that they would like to see happen and that conversation comes and is 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 um, carried by the by the theatre but then the audience responds and says this is what we should do to create this change or maybe this action will be really useful and then what happens the policy makers then come in and say okay what can we actually do as as people in positions of power how can we actually create changes or what can we do as an action to take this this um mm -hmm. socially creative moment um how can we take this further and actually action some change on it so um as a result of the legislative theater uh, event that Latoya and the, the creative leader, leader team put up, leader, leaders put on, um, we created a document which had I think two or three actions per person per policymaker that was in the room. And then um, I've actually just recently, well, we're, we're putting on pressure, so we chase them up and we say, what actions have you, what have you done since? It's been eight weeks now. What actions have you followed up with? Um, what have the impacts been that you've seen so far and just basically keeping us up to date because we are now going to be writing a blog on the Union Chapel website so it really exposes what we've done so with a lot of people come to this event um, I can't remember how maybe 80, 80 to 100 it was a well attended event so the audience was really large and there was a lot of input that came through um, and so the policy makers will be telling us how they followed through with the actions that they committed to at the event and we'll continue to follow up with them and chase that up and publicly share these are the impacts that have happened from it and i know it's it's all small but um it's a step in the right direction and the fact that policy makers are even listening and are engaging with creative ways of looking at structural change and what the community needs and our voice and their opinions and actually acting from that i think that's super impactful 
um, and to the point where Islington Council, so Union Chapel based in Islington, Islington Council has already said they would love to get the leaders involved again, the community leaders involved again, to deliver a training session for their or their staff members. So the idea of using uh, tools like legislative theatre is becoming a real um, successful method, I'd say, for long term change, hopefully. Yeah. If you'd like to share any links or documents in the chat, um, I'm sure people would be interested um, in reading more. Um, and I suppose this conference is also an opportunity to create connections and, you know, speak to your audience and even, you know, have a call to action. So I wanted to ask, is there anything that you think um, the audience today could do to help support the work of the Union Chapel or, you know, um, create any connections or anyone you'd like to work with or hear from? Yeah, I think I'd just say from, from in terms of kind of expanding Union Chapel's community outreach, basically, if you guys know any community groups, grassroots groups that would love to get involved or would maybe benefit from getting involved with Union Chapel, it's not only an amazing community art space, it's obviously a, a beautiful venue, so it can be used for a mix of different groups. So yeah, just reach out and also artists and creatives that work in an inclusive and holistic way. Um, the more we know, the better. And I think Union Chapel is really building, because I think a lot of people know Union Chapel as a music venue and sometimes don't realize that they have margins, which is a whole homelessness project that's been running for years and it's been running throughout the pandemic and that we have the work that we've done with the creative leaders and the kind of at-home resource packs and, and all the different projects that have been happening throughout Union Chapel. It's, it's the less known part of it. So we're just trying to make more noise about it and um, more creatives and more community groups are involved and want, want to partner up with us, the better really so. You can just you can email me at community at unionchapel.org.uk. Drop me a little email, and um, we can make it happen. What about you, Latoya? Is there any message you'd like to um, send across today? With the legislative theatre, it was great because, as Pianka said, the policymakers went away and they uh, promised to uh, review some of the policies that are already in existence. But also, they wanted to use legislative theatre as a tool for training as well, because um, something that did come up in the conversation when we hosted um, the play on the scenes was that there was this lack of humanity between um, the gatekeepers and the citizens. So um, one of the councillors said that they wanted to use the legislative theatre um, to, um, to come in to different departments just so people have an understanding of the real people that are behind these lived experiences. Um, so it's also, yeah, also about policy making, but also about bringing humanity into people that are in those positions. Because sometimes it's policy that needs to change, but also relations between um, people in power or um, the gatekeepers and everyday people. Um, yeah, and just, you know, it's all about, I'm all for challenging narratives um, challenging the, the narratives that's um, presented as truth when there's loads of different histories, loads of different voices, loads of different um, perspectives out there. And I think art is um, an amazing tool that allows us to um, have insights to these amazing minds that exist that can often get overlooked. Um, can I ask a slightly more personal question, I suppose, and ask you about your own process of finding your voices and identities and you know who you were as a person, as an artist, as a creative person in general? Who would like to start? <laughs> um, can, you, can you ask the question again? Let me try and think what I can, how I can share. I was just wondering about your own experience with, you know, finding your own creativity and um, how the arts has helped you throughout your life to express yourself, um, relate to other people, um, express yourself in work, in your personal life. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, let me have a little, let me have a little thing. So it's, I think it's hard to pinpoint one moment um, on how it started or the journey or anything like that, but um, actually you can talk about it. So I studied psychology at UCL and um, my dissertation was on CST, so cognitive stimulation therapy, which is used uh, for people living with dementia. 
and at that time I think during you know during the time at university I've seen very kind of formal ways of um, interacting with people and and very kind of controlled ways of doing things but CSD seems to have the, the movement and singing and games and and a lot more creativity in that space and um, I just remember seeing the impact of CST on the people that we were working with and people living with dementia and from that actually is when I started to think I can really bring um, my own passion for dance and my own uh, just personal joy that I get from dance um, and use it in a way for people in the community because I never really put the two together and it was only that moment working with CST that I thought hold on a minute there's really a tool here there's really um, there's evidence to show that these creative methods can impact um, a mix of groups in the community but as a, as a dancer, I think it's, mm -hmm. it's not um, something that is focused on. Dances are often seen very performance-based performance based and very technical. And, you know, you hardly think about the, the historical way that it's been used. It's been used to, to tell stories, to express um, your own personal experiences, for communi communication across generation, to celebrate events, you know, to, to really utilize it as a communal art form, not necessarily just as a performance-based thing. So, um, it's almost like I'm trying to do the flip and trying to bring back the kind of historical way that dance has been used. And um, it's, it's just been an amazing journey. I think for me personally, it's helped me with my expression. It's helped me with getting comfortable with my body. I think, I can't remember who it was, but someone was talking about their mind-body connection. So we know our body impacts our mind and our mind impacts our body. And I thought like the more that we can engage with bringing the, bridging those two connections and knowing that our body is a tool as well, our mind is a tool for our body. And, and, and finding a, a finding a comfort between the two of them, I think the, the more value in that, there's more value in that than, it, than is um, given to it. So um, yeah, there's been multiple, I can go on for ages, but I won't bore you all with my personal <laughs> journey on and how beautiful dance is. But also another thing I must say is that, um, even though for me, my, my personal joy, and my, obviously my tool is dance, over the years as I've worked in creative community spaces, I've learned so much about how, the impact that drama has um, on well-being and the impact that circus has on well-being, the impact that um, yoga and all so many different creative tools, creative writing, you know, all of these different tools. So now it's become a really cross arts way of working that as long as there's a form of creativity, there is really, there is benefit to be had. So um, it's opened my mind not only to my own personal kind of well-being, um, but also the creative well-being of all different arts and how I can engage with them, even though I, I have no idea how to act or perform or anything like that, or kind of write, you know, but I still love it and it's still useful for me as a tool to use for expression and creativity. So, um, yeah. Um, for me, I, I, I cannot remember a time where I wasn't creative or wasn't or didn't have these wild ideas and vivid imagination. Um, and I always look for that in people whenever I see them. Um, I started when I went to the university, I had a strong interest in a, a strong interest in filmmaking. So I studied film. Um, and it was only really after my MA that I really got to understand film as, as I enjoy it. And that's you know, independent films that deal with real stories that do that you know, explore issues, social issues, and, and it explores humanity. And I, I am fascinated with this world and the inhibitance of it. And I think art is, art is the most authentic way of having insights to other people. Um, so that's, yeah, so I just went on this course of um, showcasing other filmmakers. So I spent some time in Leeds um, and worked with um, the Hyde Park Pitch House and put on um, a series of events called Gorilla Shorts where um, we would showcase um, short films. It would be short films from new filmmakers, short films from established filmmakers, but most of the time the short films did explore human issues. Um, it, you know, it, it could be human issues that are quite explicit or it could be um, experimental ideas that just, you know, just kind of foretell concepts. Um, so 
then I moved back to London and then started something called the Short Film Movement, which I kind of took to different um, venues across London. Um, just because I thought, I think art is inclusive because everyone is creative and everyone has the ability to create. But art, the presentation of art is exclusive, I think can be quite exclusive in, in the sense that it, the way it's placed in like museums or galleries can be quite elite. So what I did with the short film movement is I took screenings to different venues or different spaces across London, like a, um, a barbershop in Soho, in the basement of a barbershop in Soho, um, in the Houseman Bookshop, which is this kind of radical bookshop on Caledonia Road, um, and in Tender Pixel Gallery in Leicester Square. So I just used to have these like pop-up screenings. And then in the screening, I would, um, I would put a call out for short filmmakers to send in their films because this was when I was really into filmmaking and I noticed that a lot of the time people would make short films just as a calling card to make a feature film. Um, and I got very disillusioned with the film industry. So that's why I kind of went underground. But then I noticed that people were, some people were making short films as snippets of life, or snippets of life and slices of a life. And those are short films that I wanted to showcase as well as the artists and their stories. So to have these screenings in these um, random spaces. And then also I, you know, my, my understanding of film is that, is what I love about film is that all art forms come together. You've got beautiful soundscapes, you've got, um, cinematography because I also have a background in photography as well and it's just all these combinations of different art forms coming together so as well as this as well as the screenings which I had themes um for one theme was innocence one theme was um predestination um I also have invited different artists to come as well so at the end of the screening of, of about four films um it might have been a poet or a songwriter. And I do remember um, my, my favorite short film movement gathering was in um, We Are Cuts in Soho in the basement. And it was on innocence. And, and obviously for me, I was, um, you know, I'd, I'd been watching loads of films on innocence. So I'd seen the different types of innocence, whether it's innocence to do with, um, you know, naivety or guilty versus innocence. Um, it was really interesting to hear people, because we also excited going back and forth, but we had a screening and we had a discussion with the filmmakers. And then also um, people started opening up about innocence and the subject matter was one that is, everyone can kind of contribute to. And I remember my friend Amy saying, Latoya, I'll come, but I'm not gonna talk. But she spoke and she, and she spoke freely and it was just this really nice environment where everyone was coming together and talking about innocence in different ways. Um, so yeah, so um, I, you know, I could go on, but I, I've always been interested in um, social issues and um, stories and people and ways of expression, but I've never really considered myself an activist up until like a few years ago, just because, you know, I live in a world that I love, but I don't see versions of it on the news. I, I, this, the kind of rhetoric or narrative that's on the news doesn't necessarily match or represent the people that I speak to and showcase because I went underground. So um, I wanted to use, I wanted to work in a community where the real stories were, not just the art community. I wanted to work in a community to hear these stories, to get material, to, to inspire, to be inspired. Um, which is why I came on board with um, the Creative Community Leadership, the Creative Community Leadership Union Chapel, because you know the Union Chapel is is music venue, as um, Pianka was saying, but it also does loads of amazing things within the community. So I wanted to be there because of that. I was interested to learn more about um, connecting art and um, policy because I've recently done a graduate diploma in law, and I wanted to like bring them together and just to see what could become of it. So the whole idea of um, exploring real issues between the people that were there, um, making it into an art form as, as in place, but then taking it to policymakers, that whole, um, that whole combination was just an amazing experience. And um, I am looking to see where it goes from there. Thank you so much, Toya and Priyanka, for sharing your experiences. It's been so interesting. And 
I mean, again, I could, um, you know, ask many more questions and listen to you um, for much longer, but I can see that we've run out of time and we need to move on. So I'd just like to thank you one more time um, and thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, that was fascinating and a different viewpoint to add to our day. So I, I found it really interesting. Now we have um, the last slot of today's event in which we are featuring Emily Bradfield, the artist with Creative Capture, who has created a visual response to the, the, to the happenings of today. Now, Dr. Emily Bradfield is an independent arts consultant and she supports people to reimagine evaluation and to manage projects creatively. She's also the charity director of Arts and Minds, an arts and mental health charity, which works across Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. Um, Emily holds a PhD in creative aging from the University of Derby. And during her PhD, which she's shown me that she did a massive experiment with post-it notes to create the order of her thesis. She developed her own style of visual note-taking, definitely with post-it notes. Very impressive. Anyway, Emily, are you here? Would I you am. like to show us what you've been creating and to talk us through your response? Okay, so I'm going to try and um, hold this up to the camera so you can all <gasps> see. Wow. So I found it really interesting actually today because my creative captures um, evolve as the session goes on. And I never know what's going to come out onto the paper until it happens. But I don't know if you can see if I just move uh, this round the outside. I've captured every single art form or creative piece of practice that people have mentioned. And that was one of my main takeaways, really, from, from doing this creative capture was the, just the breadth and diversity of creative practice and different forms and modes of arts and creativity that came out. I'm blown away, Emily. It's I will, of course, share, share on Twitter. Thank you, it's very rich. It's really interesting. It's a really interesting process because some people find them really difficult to understand. I've shown my creative captures to people who have just looked at them and said, I just don't understand. I don't know what to say. Whereas other people find them really inspiring. But what I found uh, when I was uh, working on my PhD was that I was going to lots of conferences and events and taking notes and trying to, as you say, map out my thesis and my thematic analysis. And I was trying to do it in a form that I thought I should be doing, which was to take long notes, was to record things in an Excel spreadsheet. And my mum actually said to me, Emily, why are you doing it like that? Get your felt tip pens out. That's how your brain operates. And so I started to develop this style, which I've been developing over the last five years. Um, and it started very, very basic and not very colorful. Um, and I've gradually sort of added colour um, into I it. created a spatial map of my whole page. Oh, wow. I'd love to see that. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, oh, goodness. I didn't realise I was on. I beg your pardon, Emily. Sorry. Hey, <laughs> Red Peter, you said you did something similar. Oh, yes, for my PhD, I'm neurodiverse, so I did a spatial map of my whole PhD and did chapter by chapter and my supervisors actually and I we, we drew on our spatial maps and it created um, yeah so, so I just really really understand what you did thank you sorry I didn't realize that I was unmuted <laughs> thank Thanks you for your response, yeah no. Emily, what goes on in your head whilst you're creating what, what happened today whilst you created that it was really interesting actually because when we were asked to turn our cameras off suddenly I found it much easier to concentrate because I wasn't mm. distracted there's something about being able to see yourself and other people on the screen um, but what it is is I really just I just pick out words phrases or images that really resonate with me from what people are talking about so um, the difference I found from taking full notes was that actually I'd never look at them again 
and I, I wouldn't pay attention whilst things were happening. But I find when I do my the creative capture, actually, I take more in through the process but I then go back to them and I revisit them um, and I can remember a lot more. Um, and interesting to, to note that the, the people who've mentioned um, dyslexia, because actually color is really, really useful tool for people who have dyslexia um, as a way of remembering. And actually I started that process of using color whilst I was doing my first degree. Amazing. Can you show it to us again so, and close up so we can talk, talk us around? It's like a map, isn't it? It's a map. It's kind of like a map. So I sort of... A butterfly. I love butterflies. I knew you'd like a butterfly. Um, so around the edge, we have all of the creative um, art forms and creative aspects. Yeah. And that um, figurehead is from our logo. It is, yes done by the wonderful Tori, who is um, tweeting everything about the conference today. Big shout out for Tori, we love Tori. I'm trying to show you different aspects of it. Yeah. Uh, Activism via art, hip hop heels, yes. <laughs> and there's a, is that a match on fire? Yes, yeah, so that was um, talking. That was somebody mentioned reigniting imagination. Yeah. So the match is um, highlighting the reignition. Fantastic. So if you um, put that on 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 Twitter, could I download the JPG and send it to everyone? Absolutely. Or is that right. I can take a J. I can send it to you as well. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. And I will be doing one tomorrow. So yeah. I've, already, I've already started page two. This is the, this is where it's the process starts, the blank canvas for tomorrow. So this is a call for come back tomorrow and find out what happens next. So thank, thank you, Emily, and thank you everyone for a very, very rich three hours of conference. I've had a fantastic time. I've learned a lot. I feel very inspired and happy. So thank you everyone and I hope to see you tomorrow. Take care, bye.